I'd like to call this meeting of joint meeting of the Board of Health and the Board of County Commissioners to order. Today is Tuesday, August 25th, 2015. And the first item on the agenda is adjustments to the agenda. Any adjustments to the agenda? Seeing none, we'll move on to public comments. And this is a joint meeting of both the Board of Commissioners and the Board of Health. So there are actually two opportunities for public comment this morning. If you wish to address us this morning during this meeting, so you can go ahead and get going. And, 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 and it's a general item. I'll take public comment from anyone that wants to now, or they can wait until we, we um, convene our regular board meeting and comment then. So uh, I'll, I'll offer the opportunity to the one person I do have signed up for public comment right now, whether they want to speak now or wait till the regular meeting. So uh, Ms. Otani, do you want to speak now? Would you prefer to speak now or wait for the regular meeting? Then why don't you come on up and state your name and where you're from for the record. And uh, I'll um, also have uh, Pat Hoover uh, if you if you'd wish to speak also. So go ahead. Thank you for making that accommodation. <laughs> You don't have to, yes, <laughs> thank you. Yeah. You don't have to um, sit through a whole bunch of discussion of tobacco to talk to us about parks. Right, I mean, it would be interesting, but that's fine. Um, good morning, I'm Ellen Otani from Eugene, and as you probably will guess, um, I'm here to talk about the North Bottomlands of Howard Buford Recreation Area. I re recently sent each of you an email requesting 15 minutes of your time to brief you on a set of documents that will take more than three minutes to explain. In fact, it may take me three minutes to explain why I need 15 minutes to explain. Um, by better way of an, um, better by way of a better introduction, I passed the CPA exam and have worked for small businesses as well as in the business office of the school district north of Los Angeles that was building three new schools and gaining a thousand students a year so I am aware of some of the challenges uh, that are faced by a government agency. I realized early on that the problem with what I consider unauthorized misuse of the North Bottomlands for large events was the res result of a system or inter internal control failure. It has come to my attention that the issues go deeper than not allowing the Parks Advisory Committee to exercise their advice and consent function. You, the commissioners, must have complete, accurate, and relevant information to make valid decisions. This could be a job for your internal auditor, but she can only do one thing at a time, and I agree with your priorities that she should um, handle mental health first. There are critical areas that need to be explored before the new Park and Open Space Master Plan that was just posted becomes finalized. The Large Event Task Force has not completed its work, yet the Master Plan appears to have been written as if conversion to large event to a large events venue were already approved and being implemented in what I consider a complete violation of the HBR master plan currently in force. So I have um, brought a copy of the email in case it, because I realize that you have stacks and stacks of um, emails, but I hope that you will allow me uh, 15 minutes of each of your time to um, explain my concerns in greater detail. Thank you. Thank you. So, Pat, do you want to address this now, or? Sure. Thank you. I too would like to thank you for the <coughs> accommodation. Um, I'm Pat Hoover. I live in the north part of Eugene. I'm here to talk about parks, and I'm here as a consumer. Um, you know me as a person involved with the Parks Advisory Committee, but um, I, I've, just, I've got some concerns about um, what I've read and watched and observed with uh, Mr. Mokra Heisky's uh, reign as the administrator. Um, I have the strategic plan that uh, he put together in his first year. I'm impressed with this. Uh, but I, I'm concerned that possibly 
one division of the Lane County government is still not up to speed with the openness and the transparency and the accountability that Mr. Mokrajewski is really keying on in this strategic plan. And I think all of you are as we start sort of the new era with him. A perfect example, I drove out to Mount Pisgah a couple of weeks ago, and there's a brand new directional sign after you cross the river into the park. And to the north, it lists the name Emerald Meadows. And I was taken aback by that. That memorializes something that was done with no transparency, no accountability, and no openness. That naming of the north bottomlands was done with basically an autocratic order from Parks Division. And there was no vetting of that by the public. No one knew what Emerald Meadows was. We already have two parks in Lane County. We have Emerald Park and we have Meadow Park. And had any of the PAC members or the public been asked, or the stakeholders at HBRA, the partners out at HBRA, had they been asked what should we name north bottomlands, if they even chose to rename it, I can't imagine it would have come up with that name. And that is not open and transparent. That is not even translucent. It's like a blackout when no one knows from the public and inside the agency that something's being done like that. So I really want to have the precepts of this really good strategic plan that Mr. Mokrajewski put together used by all parts of Lane County. I mean, all of us need to be trying to be transparent and open and accountable to each other and with each other. So that's a concern of mine. And as we go forward, as Ellen mentioned, the master plan is up for public comment now. It's on the website. We're starting to have public meetings. It's just really important that the public be part of the process of including naming things and approving things and having the public weigh in and get a chance to weigh in on their parks. I mean, the parks belong to the people. So thank you very much. You're welcome. So that's everyone I had signed up to speak in public comment. Is there anyone else that wishes to address the Board of Health and Board of Commissioners this morning? Seeing none, we'll move on to Commissioner's response to public comments and or other issues and remonstrance. Any comments from Commissioners? Commissioner Sorensen. When Ms. Otani was talking this morning about her request for 15 minutes from each of us, it occurred to me that maybe there would be some economy of scale if she took 15 minutes at an upcoming board meeting and then we could hear her perspective on what she's raised this morning. Commissioner Farr. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just a clarification. We will have another opportunity for comments during the regular board meeting. Yes. Thank you. Just a comment regarding Emerald Meadows. I'm looking at the website on Emerald. It's called Emerald Meadows at Buford Park. And so I'm interested to know when it was named and what process was used for name. I'd also like to hear the other parks in Lane County, some examples of when they were named and what process was used for naming parks. I don't know that there's always a public process for naming things, and I'd like to see where that falls in the grand scheme of deciding what landmarks or land features or parks are named. Thank you. Any other comments or remonstrance? Seeing none, then we'll move on to item 4A, which is order 1508-2501 in the matter of approving submission of comments to the Food and Drug Administration on the extension of the agency's authority to regulate additional tobacco products and related actions. And we have Alicia Hayes. I will do the introductions. Thank you. I was going to ask you to. I thought the title was long enough to get us a chance to wheel up here. And if you'll make sure you talk into the mics for everybody. Very close to the mic. 
Good morning, Commissioners. Good morning, Chair Bozovich and Commissioners. Uh, this morning, I, uh, doing our presentation, is Dr. Lissandra Guzman, and Dr. Guzman is our Associate Public Health Officer. Um, she's one of, she's also a preventative medicine uh, physician. She's one of our bilingual staff and bilingual doctors, and she sees patients uh, part-time at Charnelton, uh, the CHC clinic. Also, you may see, or maybe you have seen, or you will see, uh, her name or her emails or her contact uh, as we do our emergency preparedness and response. She and Dr. Ludke share that role. And today, Dr. Guzman has a presentation and uh, request. Dr. Guzman. Thank you. Good morning, Chair Bozovich and Commissioners. So he's going to stop you and tell you to pull the mic closer. <laughs> this is better? He's going to do that for him. Okay. There this is thanks, better? Yes. Okay. Um, at any point in time, please let me know if uh, my voice keeps coming down. Um, so we are here to request your support. Um, we would like to submit comments to the FDA in response to their advance notice of proposed rulemaking, uh, supporting the implementation of nicotine exposure warning labels and child resistant packaging for nicotine liquid and nicotine containing e-liquids, uh, including novel tobacco products. I'm hearing an echo. Is that just me? That's the sound system, but it's... Okay. You're doing okay. It means that you're close enough to the microphone if you're hearing that echo a little bit. <laughs> okay. So this is our request, that for all tobacco, for all products containing liquid nicotine and novel tobacco products, um, the FDA requires a child-resistant packaging and the placement of warming, warning labels um, that include the, the potential harms, the poison control number for in case of emergency, a text that states keep out of reach of children, and also there should be a color picture for people that have low literacy levels. Um, and studies have shown that it's beneficial if it's in large font, placed in front of the package, simple language, and it should be rotated regularly to avoid overexposure and reduction in effectiveness. So why is labeling important? It is because nicotine is an acute toxin. Um, there is a misunderstanding of the risks um, associated with these products due to the industry's aggressive marketing tactics. People do need to know that exposure to nicotine is not only by smoking it, but also by inhaling it, by swallowing it, um, and even by skin contact. It can result in nausea, vomiting, respiratory arrest, and even seizures and death. It can cross the placenta, uh, eventually impairing the brain development of the fetus. Uh, it's also caused preterm births and SIDS. Many people are just not aware of these effects and the danger that comes with its use, so it's only fair to make them aware. The evidence that cigarette warnings, um, there is evidence that cigarette warnings do work. They have been found to be a source of information on the health hazards. They've also encouraged smokers to quit, and they've also discouraged non-smokers to start smoking. They are effective. In terms of the packaging, the packaging is also important. It prevents um, or protects anyone from unintentional exposure, and that includes adults and children. Personally speaking, I know of an elderly who um, wears glasses and uses eye drops, and she didn't have her eye, um, glasses on, and she uh, searched for a bottle that looked like an eyedropper, and it was actually her um, nicotine bottle. So, um, to say the least, she had retinas all around her eyes, irritation, and it wasn't a coconut flavor, it was actually menthol, so it made things worse. And then I had to um, advise the parents, which are my closest friends, um, to be careful when the children go over to her house. And they were actually surprised, and they, they had never thought about that, that the mom had, the grandmother had the vials just exposed. 
Um, so it has a protective effect in improving storage and improving child safety. We also need a minimum national um, standard in terms of packaging. Many states are beginning to include a child resistant packaging, but they are missing the enforcement mechanism. So now we have a national patchwork of regulations with inconsistent or non-existent enforcement. Products have a kid-friendly packaging, different flavors, different scents, and they're pretty attractive to children. The goal would be to prohibit uh, this type of attractive marketing. So as you can see, there's pictures there of the Bazooka Joe. Um, probably the flavor is, is a gum flavor. And this um, picture down here was um, from an assessment that was done here in Lane County where you see the nicotine and e-cigarette uh, very close to Skittles and, and ice cream. So... Um, <clears throat> This is our concern. E-cigarettes are being marketed to children. They're colorful, fun, flavorful, as I said before, candy flavor, fruit flavor. Um, the packaging is kid-friendly, and they're pretty easily obtainable as well. During the 2014 Lane County Retail Assessment, 61% of the retailers were found to be placing tobacco and e-cigarette products um, or advertising them within 12 feet of products like candy and toys, and also three feet off the floor, which is a three to four year old um, eye level. Vaping is now seen as glamorized and the technology is pretty cool and trendy. So this is why it's also important. The calls to poison control centers are rising. So these are for e-cigarette exposures by mouth in the United States. As you can see in the year 2010, we only we started with one call in September a month. I mean, yeah, a month, sorry. And then as you see there's been an increasing trend to we have up to 2014. And in 2014 we were up to 215 calls a month to poison control centers regarding e nicotine exposure in children. As you there's an error in this graph actually from there's 2010, 2011, 2012, 2012, 2014. So the second 2012 is 2013, sorry. Um, so there is a 143% increase from 2013 to 2014 in calls. <clears throat> Ingesting one-fourth of a teaspoon of a concentrated liquid um, nicotine is actually lethal for a 50-pound child. In Lane County, there were five reported cases under the age of six last year. Today, that we know of, there's been at least two cases of children. In last year, uh, Lane County spent about $258 million on tobacco-related medical costs and lost productivity due to the premature tobacco-related deaths. There were 720 deaths last year. This is something that could have been prevented. This is equivalent to two people dying every day or two jumbo jets crashing every year having Lane County residents. As youth continue to use novel nicotine products that lead to nicotine addiction and eventually switching to other tobacco products, we would expect the death toll to increase. And as you, Commissioner Farr, has said before, it increases the medical expenditure and it affects us all. Developing strategies to monitor and prevent future poisonings is critical. Given the rapid increase in e-cigarette related poisonings, evidence shows that e-cigarette liquid containing nic nicotine have the potential to cause immediate adverse effects and it represents an emerging public health concern. With proper labeling, we can raise public awareness, and with a standardized child packaging, we can decrease nicotine exposure among children, and that is our main goal. Thank you, Dr. Guzman. Um, I, I appreciate the report, um, and, and I apologize if I've been hacking a little bit here, but I feel like I was smoking this weekend in Lane <laughs> County. Um, <laughs> So uh, the one question I have is on um, the 
request in your in the comments for um, not only the textual keep out of reach of children, but some kind of symbolic warning. Would it be good to reference U.S. Pharmacopeia's um, standardized warnings that they put on uh, pharmacy products that have been kind of time tested? Um, uh, you know, they, they've gone through just about every symbol you can kind of think of. That's whether it's to be taken by mouth or, or you know, all the various things. But it, would that be a proper um, a reference, maybe for because um, you know this really is. A, a drug we're talking about, and I think that's the, the maybe the correct agency to refer to for a textual warning. They have the same warning that's on on medicine as keep out of reach of children could be the same one that's on on the nicotine uh, liquids. So the question was whether we should use the same approach as the pharmaceutical companies. Well, basically, U.S. Pharmacopeia is the standardization organization for pharmacy products, and they've developed a set of standardized um, non-textural symbols for everything from, you know, taken orally to, yes. you know, uh, and several other warnings, you know, taking with food, take with food, don't take with food. Okay. You know, you guys have probably all seen them. Yeah. Stickered onto your little bottles you get from the pharmacy, but they have a probably have a standard one about um, keep out of reach of children uh, or not. I don't know if they do, but I, I think that might be a, a basis for trying to um, stick with what the industry is, is used to, and also kind of put um, e-cigarette e liquids on the same basis as pharmaceuticals because it's a drug. Oh, uh, yeah. Thank you, Chair Bozovich, Commissioners. Uh, absolutely, we would be happy to take a look at that and find language to put into the letter that references that they take a look at that. And we are consistent, because I think the consistency is also very important as, as we move forward with this packaging. Thank you. I think Commissioner Farr had a question. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm going to talk more about this bottle a little bit later on, but, uh, you know, I'm not six years old, uh, and because of that, um, I have a bit of difficulty reading the print on this. In fact, even at that distance, I can't read the print on this. Um, Six-year-olds have better eyesight than I do, but I think they have difficulty reading the, the warning labels on this. They're, yeah, that's a warning label. I can tell that, but I can't see what it says. You know, And this is Girl Scout cookie liquid. Mmm, sounds good, doesn't it? Doesn't that sound delicious? Now, I know that the responsible retailers in Lane County some of whom are with us today, would uh, screen selling this stuff to kids, even with the lack of labeling, even with the uh, uh, seductive labeling that's on here, that uh, Girl Scout cookies, uh, nothing, all, it's all good here, it says. Uh, all good. Um, so, you know, I, I, I know that that's not happening with the, with the responsible retailers, but not everybody's responsible. And anybody, if, uh, up until the time that uh, we passed our ordinance, uh, uh, six-year-old kid could go in and buy this and do whatever they wanted to do with it. You know, Girl Scout cookies, drink that, right? I love Girl Scout cookies. I love Bazooka Joe. You know, so I think uh, I'm, I'm in full support of, uh, of stronger labeling that makes it so that people, uh, kids aren't enticed by, by the labeling and, and that uh, people are warned away from it. Uh, I'll, I'll talk more about this issue a little bit later on, but you know, if we spend one tenth as much money as we spend responding to tobacco-related illnesses, if we spend one tenth as much money as we spend trying to get people to start smoking, trying to get people to stop smoking or quit start not start smoking, if we spend one tenth of that amount of money, maybe nobody in this country would smoke. Maybe nobody in this country would use tobacco products. We wouldn't be having this discussion. But we have this discussion. We have to have this discussion. I don't want kids to start smoking. And I don't want, uh, I, I want adults who have chosen to start smoking to find ways to quit and have uh, very good, very impressive ways, ways that are just as seductive as Girl Scout cookie-flavored liquid nicotine, ways that are just as effective to get people to consider quitting smoking, because a lot of people don't consider quitting, and a lot of people don't know their options. So I'm in favor of this, and I think, uh, thank you for the presentation, Dr. Kuzman. I'd like to take a second to welcome you to Lane County, and thank you for joining our team, most effective team, uh, one of our, the most effective health teams you're ever going to see in the nation, and uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Mr. Sorensen. Um, I just wanted to ask you to back that um, slide up a little bit. Um, <clears throat> um, right there. Um, 
could you give us some idea <clears throat> of, of where it says nicotine is an acute toxin? Could you give us some idea of where that stands in relationship to other um, bad substances, I guess, that people routinely ingest, like uh, caffeine or maybe, I don't know, Okay. Other bad things that people that they're legally allowed to eat or consume as adults. Could you give us some idea of, of that? Because not everybody's a physician, and come to think of it, I think you might be the only one in the room. So, can you give us some idea so we can understand a little more about what does that sentence mean? Nicotine is acute toxin. Okay. Uh, Chair Bozivich and Commissioners. Um, in reference, let's say, to caffeine, there's a lot of products out there that have caffeine. Um, I can't say that just by drinking one or two will not kill you. Um, I can't say that they w would be indirectly um, leading you to um, problems with your heart as it stimulates your um, autoimmune response, your blood pressure, your heart rate, and if your body is not um, able to handle that, then that could be a bad thing. Um, but it's, it's not as potent as this nicotine. The problem with nicotine is that it's been very concentrated. It's sold as very concentrated. So one teaspoon can kill a kid. A tablespoon can kill a person, any one of us. And there's more than a tablespoon in that little bottle. So that's the problem that we're seeing, the concentration difference. There's a lot of chemicals in our food that cause um, harm to us. You know, even the... Um, the uh, sugar substitutes that people use nowadays. There are studies that show that it may lead to cancer, but we still use it. It won't kill us right away, but it could have side effects eventually. But with this, it's pretty immediate. Is that to distinguish nicotine from other bad things that are in cigarettes? That are bad for you, such as the particulates. They're bad for you, but you won't die from it okay, that, okay. immediately? I, yes, immediately. So if you take a cigarette, nicotine is not really what's bad for you in a cigarette. It is the other um, over 200 components that it has that can cause a cancer. But nicotine itself doesn't cause cancer. It is the addictive part that keeps everyone or smokers coming more and smoking more of it. But it is the form that we have created that we have made it more concentrated for too much for our body. So that's, that's different. But in comparison to the other um, uh, products, it's... Uh, nicotine it was not going like, to cause cancer or anything like that. Right. So it's a concentration difference. Are there any regulations of nicotine? In what sense? Well, federal, state, uh, county, city. Are there any restrictions on the sale of a product that is um, an acute toxin? Containing nicotine. Um, I don't think so. Or is that what this notice of proposed rulemaking is about, is to perhaps have a proposed rule, and that's why they're taking public comment on a notice of proposed rulemaking. So, Chair Bozovich, Commissioner Sorensen, I think you're absolutely right. We've talked a lot about the lack of regulations around these products, and I think when we started talking about your local e-cigarette ordinance a year and a half ago, we talked about how great it would be if the FDA would adopt a national regulation, and they still aren't there, but this is um, their opportunity to at least begin to collect comment to move toward those regulations. Um, here in Lane County, we've regulated the sale of these products. We've said you can't sell them to anyone under 18. You need to have a license to sell them. Those types of regulations we've created here in the county, but there isn't a national standard yet. Okay. Thank you very much, and I, too, would like to welcome you to our... Thank you. County uh, 
department and the important responsibilities you have. Commissioner Farr. Thank you. Just uh, maybe a little bit in response to Commissioner Swanson's question, I'm looking at an article called Lethal Nicotine Intoxication in a Group of Mules. Uh, 3.5 parts per million killed mules. Sounds like a little tiny bit to me. <laughs> so I, I'm not sure how that, uh, how that compares to arsenic or uh, other, uh, you know, other lethal toxins, but 3.5 parts per million is not a huge concentration. Well, it probably is in in chemical terms, but, uh, but uh, just in answer to Commissioner Sorensen's uh, uh, question, it does kill mules, and mules, I think, are a little bit more hardy than human beings. Yes. Well, according to that, um, you know, peer-reviewed magazine, Popular Science, <laughs> it, it, it takes about six gallons of McDonald's coffee for a lethal dose of caffeine. Uh-oh. So, <laughs> just, more given time. <laughs> just, just, just for you know future knowledge, but uh, you know almost you know almost everything we ingest, um, you know it's the dose that makes the poison. Water is actually lethal if you drink too much of it, and there was actually that one sad case where some radio station had a contest about chugging water where one of the competitors died. Um, so it, it's uh, it it's the dose that makes the poison, you know, and, but, um, and nicotine is probably a very low dose poison compared to, as far as lethal dose goes, compared to a lot of other chemicals that we ingest in our body. Um, and that's one of the reasons why this is so important because in tobacco, the concentration is not that high. It still can make a kid sick if they eat cigarettes. Not that you know, kids will get very far in eating cigarettes because it tends to make them sick and taste really bad. Um, but uh, the issue with these e-cigarette liquids is with the flavor, they actually are attractive. It's almost like ethylene glycol is to pets. It tastes good, but it, uh, you know, it doesn't take but a tablespoon or so to kill a pet. Um, That's yeah. antifreeze? Antifreeze, yeah. yeah. Sorry. <laughs> For those that don't know. Um, so it, it's, you know, it. It, it, they put a flavor in it, it tastes great, yet it's lethal. It's not in childproof packaging. So I think it's really important that we weigh in on this as the Board of Health, and I really appreciate you all bringing it forward to us. Um, and it's part of what we talked about when we originally came up with our e-cigarette ordinance is we didn't try to control the packaging and all that because it's too difficult at the county level because the folks that make this aren't all located in Lane County. This really needs to be state and federal regulation of an industry. Um, to get conformity to, to make it a safe product. Um, and, and I think F, FDA is one of the places where that needs to happen. So I appreciate you bringing this forward. So don't drink antifreeze, arsenic, or this. Yeah. Yep. Is there any further comment or questions? If not, I'll entertain a motion on the order. Mr. Stewart. <clears throat> Mr. Chair, I would move approval order 15-08-25-1 in the matter of approving submission of comments to the Food and Drug Association Administration on the ex extension of the agency's authority to regulate additional tobacco products and their relative actions with this amendment that you try to incorporate the comments of the chair around trying to use uniform warning labels. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Any discussion to the motion? Seeing and hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. That moves us on to item um, 4B, which is uh, an update uh, from Health and Human Services um, on the implementation of House Bill 3100, the Public Health Modernization Bill passed by the legislation legislature this past Definitely. session, so yeah. so I'll, I'll up. pass it back to um, Alicia again and Karen. Thank you, Chair Bozovich. We are, we are ready to go. I'm going to pass it on to Karen for the presentation. Good morning again, uh, Chair Bozovich and Commissioners. We thought since you were convened as the Board of Health today, we would take a few minutes in your agenda to give you a brief update on this important legislation that passed last session. 
and I anticipate we'll continue to give you updates uh, through the rest of this year and next year uh, on the work that the state is doing around modernization of public health, since as the Board of Health, um, that will impact the work that you do and, and certainly what we do in the department. So I'm going to start with a little bit of background, and I know um, through the Legislative Committee and, and other venues you've been tracking on this, but in 2013, uh, the Task Force on the Future of Public Health Services was created to develop recommendations back to the legislature. And those um, final recommendations were submitted, and then in the last session, um, the first implementation bill uh, took the form of House Bill 3100 to start to look at the frame of what would a modern public health system in Oregon look like, what would the essential functions be, and then eventually we'll need to talk about how we would fund that. Um, I won't read necessarily through all of these recommendations, but particularly for those people who might be in the viewing public who aren't familiar, I did want to at least highlight a few of the task force recommendations. Um, they first looked at really what are the foundation capabilities and programs that need to be present in every public health system, both the state public health system and then every local public health authority. Um, so what are those foundational capabilities? and then once that's established, um, how as a state we need to have significant and sustained funding identified to really support those foundational capabilities. Thirdly, they looked at statewide implementation of the capabilities um, occurring in waves over time. And we'll talk a little bit about the timeline in the future. This isn't something where the legislature just flips the switch and suddenly we have a modern public health system, but it really will be implemented over time. Uh, local public health should have flexibility in um, operationalizing those capabilities. So if we have a statewide standard, then there is flexibility um, both within existing county health departments and then also opening the door for the possibility of regional public health services, um, multi-county um, collaboratives that might occur as well. Uh, at one point, there was some discussion about regionalizing all of public health and um, the policy really backed off of that and left it more as a local option of how best to organize in different parts of the state. And then finally looking at improvements and changes in the public health system, really structuring those around metrics um, and evaluation and accountability. And that includes some restructuring of the current public health advisory board. So um, those were a lot of the pieces in those task force recommendations. And then House Bill 3100 um, specifically adopted uh, the foundational capabilities, and I have a slide in a few minutes that will highlight exactly what those were. Um, as I said, changed the composition and the role of the Public Health Advisory Board, that's the statewide board, um, beginning this coming January, and required uh, both the state and local public health authorities to begin a process of assessing our current abilities to address those foundational capabilities and then submit a report of findings no later than January of 2017. So we're in just beginning to embark upon that assessment process now. And then 3100 also states that um, local public health authorities will submit plans for implementing those capabilities no later than 2023. So again, we have some time as we move through this to be thoughtful. So this, oh, and it doesn't project as well as I would have hoped up there. Um, this identifies the um, foundational capabilities, and since they're a little hard to read, um, I'll run through those quickly. Those are assessment and epidemiology, so that's a lot around our communicable disease program. Emergency preparedness and response. The third one is communications. The fourth is policy and planning. There's a capability around leadership and organizational competencies, one around health equity and cultural responsiveness, and then finally community partnership development. So when we talk about foundational capabilities, it's the expectation that state public health and every local public health authority will have those capabilities um, fully fleshed out and operationalized. And then there was also a process to identify what are the foundational programs. And then the concept is to set kind of a minimum bar that every jurisdiction has to provide of these foundational programs. 
and then um, open the opportunity that some local communities might decide they want more of some things than what that minimum standard is, and so they can certainly add to those based on their needs. And so those foundational programs are um, communicable disease control, environmental health, prevention and health promotion, and then access to clinical preventive services. So as we start to think about uh, our modern public health system, it's really expected to be organized around those foundational programs. And again, local public health authorities can decide they want to do more than that. Um, but when my understanding is when the state and the legislature look at assigning funding levels, they're going to make sure that they can adequately fund those foundational programs. So I will let you know right now the process, uh, the Conference of Local Health Officials, which includes health administrators and health officers, is working through each of those foundational capabilities and really trying to get clear and specific about what we mean that public health departments should have communications. What does that actually look like? Um, and then that's all working towards this eventual assessment that will need to be turned in by 2017. So that truly is just to give you an update and then also to give you an opportunity if there are any particular things you're concerned about or have questions about or places where as our local public health authority you want to make sure we provide an opportunity for you to have input, um, it would be good to know that on the front end so we don't miss any opportunities. Commissioner Lykin. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you, Karen. Appreciate the update on this. I do have a question here, and it's related to item D in your in in your um, uh, the information here. It says financial and/or uh, resource considerations. There's not a financial consideration for this update. However, future action related to implement implementation of HB 3100 will likely influence state revenue allocations for Lane County Public Health. Good or bad? <laughs> well, isn't that the great question, Commissioner Lykin? Um, I'm hoping it will influence it positively. Uh, there seems to be a, um, a strong desire to make sure that we have sufficient funding statewide to really provide the high quality public health services that are necessary um, in Oregon. And um, you know, I don't think it's going out on a limb to say historically the state has, has underfunded those services. So I'm hopeful that this attention and, and commitment to having the right services at the right level will result in better funding support for those. But it's still awfully early to know. And then the other question I had on the, on the, uh, the makeup of the task force, was that a task force, is that correct? The original task force, okay. yes. Whether, uh, whether people who represented, uh, say, Southern Oregon, were they a part of this task force? Because as you know, some of these counties are prepared to give away their public health authority, and I'm not sure Oregon Health can handle all of this, and so I think it's interesting the discussion about the, the regional aspect, aspect, but then the, the decision was maybe not I move forward on that. So, do you do you know of any if any members of the task force? I'd like I'd like to. I'm. It, so many of these are Portland centric, where they don't have these issues that that the down south necessarily have. So I don't know if if you uh, if you have information on that or if you could supply information to the board. I I think I'd appreciate that. Uh, Chair Bozovich, Commissioner Lykin, I don't remember off the top of my head, but I absolutely can send that. I remember. There were Central Oregon representatives, so I know it wasn't only Portland-centric, but I don't remember about Southern Oregon, but I'll get that list out. I appreciate that. And uh, the last question I have is we kind of went through this with the Justice Re Reinvestment Act as well from two years ago, and those commitments were broken. Are you confident that, that the makeup of the task force, that moving forward, do you believe that these commitments will stay firm? Uh, because it seemed to me the speaker just wasn't very interested in keeping those commitments and went into another direction. I know Chair Bozovich was very involved in that. And uh, so your assessment is, do you believe that the legislature will actually maybe stay and in, in, in hopefully actually stay true to their word? Chair Bozovich, I, like I was going to say, say, I hear this noise here to my right. <laughs> actually, I would, um, commissioners, I would say if... 
Karen can guess that, we should probably give her another job. Um, she should come to work with county administration with you. It's, it is always hard to tell, but I feel that the, the people involved and, and the locals are, are committed to this, and it's, it's a good move. Our hope is, and we'll do our best as we work through this, uh, to make sure that the changes stick, if you will. But. Uh, and I would add to that, I think it will be our opportunity, and, and a piece, quite frankly, of why I'd like to have it on your radar as we move forward <coughs> is I think we do need to watch it carefully, mm -hmm. and um, these will have significant long-term impacts for public health, and, and I would like to think that it will be on our, um, our list as the legislature convenes. I wasn't expecting an answer, but I was. I just felt like it was important to get it out there in case we need to uh, be anticipating heavy lifting in the near future. So, uh, But thank you very much, and I, I appreciate and And really, I, I think what's important is I really appreciate uh, our staff and, and Alicia, Karen, you, the two of you in particular, just staying, in, staying engaged with this. I think it's important. And uh, I will echo what uh, Commissioner Farr mentioned. We have an outstanding public health authority and the Health and Human Services as a whole. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Commissioner Farr. Thank you, Commissioner Bozovich, and, and thank you both for uh, refraining from uh, any disparaging remarks for legislators that are restricted to current legislators. And uh, Commissioner Sorensen and I both thank you for not bringing up past legislators. <laughs> uh, and thank you, Commissioner Lykin, for the questions regarding the task force, the, the uh, spreading out throughout Oregon. Looking at House Bill 3100, which is now enrolled, uh, I see that uh, Dr. Senator Bates was on was one of the chief sponsors. So I would. In, in, guess that uh, anything moving forward would be under his close scrutiny, but uh, that, would, that would be just a hazard, I guess. And also to look at the other sponsors, uh, Lane County is pretty heavily, um, pretty heavily represented in the sponsorship of HB 3100. So, thank you. So um, I actually testified in committee on this bill um, up in, you know, with the help of uh, Mr. Tyler. There were a couple questions about it that, that we were that we were concerned about at the time, as I remember in the bill. One was whether or not they provided the ability, you know, they actually were withdrawing a portion of ORS that allowed for relinquishment of, of the public health authority back to the state by a county. Did they fix that problem in the final version of the bill? Chair Bozovich, you know, I have the final version with me, and I wouldn't want to give an answer without checking that. I know that there was a lot of um, struggle with that particular language, uh, particularly as Douglas County was starting to um, – their decision-making process about whether or not to um, withdraw. So I know there was an interest in changing that language, but I don't know what the final version was, but I can certainly check and get back. Yeah, I was having trouble finding it quickly. Yeah. Um, the other question was there was some issue about – um, creating almost a, a, a dual process to the chip where it was going to create a bunch of extra reporting that was basically almost the same thing we have to do to develop a chip and then and keep keep tabs of the community health improvement plan. Was that fixed in the bill or are, they, are we still doing two processes that report basically the same thing? Chair Bozovich, I think um, at this point, it seems like that duplication has been avoided. You know, at this, we're still at a pretty high level, so there's time to see how it will play out. The other process that's parallel for most counties and certainly the state is the accreditation process. As you know, we're in the process of applying for accreditation. The state already has. And that also requires um, jurisdictions to go through a lot of those processes. So the idea at this point is to try and have as much alignment as possible so that what people People do for those processes can just be funneled through to kind of count for these things as well. Excellent. Good. Any other questions? Well, thank you for the update on that. So that moves us on to item 4C, which is the fourth reading of Ordinance 1505 in the matter of amending Lane Code Chapter 9 to address tobacco sale regulation issues related to discount pricing, proximity of sales, locations serving children, and fees and penalties. And we have Ms. Hayes again. <laughs> Phil, or, or is it? I feel very important here as I take my time, uh, Chair Bozovich, to introduce Karen, who's going to do the presentation. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and 
Commissioners, we have certainly been talking about this a lot recently, so I did not prepare a lengthy presentation, and at the same time, I'm conscious we may have some viewers who are new to the conversation. So um, if it's your pleasure, I thought I would just briefly go through what the um, four main areas are where there are proposed amendments and then um, take any questions that you might have. Does that make sense? That works. Okay. Thank you. So we'll go through these pretty quickly. Um, by way of background, as I said, we've um, been working on this issue of tobacco retail licensing for quite some time as part of your work on the Community Health Improvement Plan and then the county's strategic plan. Uh, last December, you adopted a tobacco retail licensing program for unincorporated Lane County. And then through the implementation of that process last May, you asked for an update on um, implementation and uh, stakeholder feedback. And so as a result of that report, you asked us to prepare a series of options for your consideration for amending the ordinance. Since then, uh, we have uh, four specific areas uh, that are proposed amendments in the, uh, the draft ordinance that's attached for this reading. The first is in the area of coupons and price discounts. So your current code prohibits retailers from uh, honoring or accepting discounts or coupons for tobacco purchase. And in light of our earlier agenda item, I will remind people that tobacco in your ordinance is defined to also include e-cigarettes. So wherever we're using tobacco, it includes both. So these amendments would delete um, that particular section K through N of um, 9.753 and delete that prohibition. This, the second area for amendments uh, is in the area of proximity to schools and youth serving organizations uh, and then what what will we do? Uh, grandfathering is the term we've been using here uh, for those retailers who are currently located uh, close to those to schools. So the current code prohibits new retailers within a thousand feet of uh, establishments serving children and that's defined fairly broadly in the code. Um, it does allow for current retailers to stay in their um, their current site. Um, however, if they were to sell their store, the license is not transferable to the, the subsequent owner. So these amendments that are before you today would uh, limit the 1,000 foot restriction only to public schools and also would allow all current uh, tobacco retailer locations to be grandfathered into their current location. Um, so even if they sell, that location could continue to be licensed to sell tobacco. The third area was in community education. Again, your current code um, has, we're really talking about two words in the definition or the description of how the license revenue, the application fee revenue can be spent. Um, and it allows right now for that to pay for tobacco retailer and community education. And uh, there was concern raised that by allowing for that revenue to be spent on community education, it could open the door for this program to be defined as a tax. And so this amendment deletes the words and community. It doesn't change how much revenue is collected, but what it can be spent on. And then the fourth area was in fines and penalties. Your current code establishes a schedule of fines and suspensions that are progressive. Basically, the um, you know each additional violation gets a higher fine and more quickly leads towards suspension or revocation. And all of that is within a five-year look-back period. So any violation basically doesn't drop off until five years have passed. Uh, in these amendments, uh, we've modeled the language on what OLCC does. So that look back period instead of five years is two years. And the fine and suspension schedule has been changed to mirror what OLCC has. And then you also ask that we add a reference in the code to um, the existing penalty for clerks who sell. So we've included that also. So that's an overview of what these amendments are, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Commissioner Sorensen. Um, on the first slide you had was about the uh, coupons. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess it was, yeah, there was that slide. And it says coupons and price discounts. And, and first of all, 
Um, are these slides on the website, county website? No, they are not, but I'm happy to provide them okay. if you would like. That would be helpful um, to uh, the public trying to follow all this. Secondly, uh, with regard to the the um, the issue here of uh, of tobacco as distinct from e-cigarette, you mentioned, I think, in your presentation that that. This not only would apply to cigarettes in the f traditional form that we have in cigarettes, but it would also apply to e-cigarettes. And I think the testimony was pretty overwhelming that the retailers were concerned about cigarette sales at their sort of community stores and stores and I'm wondering why we would include e-cigarettes when the testimony was was all about traditional cigarettes. Chair Bozovich and Commissioner Sorensen, the definition that is in the code uh, that was adopted back in December defines a tobacco product as any product that is made from or derived from tobacco which contains nicotine or similar substances um, and then it goes on to basically say including but not limited to a cigarette, a cigar, pipe tobacco, chewing tobacco, snuff, snus, or snus, or an electronic smoking device and basically specifically then says it does not include cessation products. My recollection of your discussion at the time and you all may remember it better than I do, um, but there was a desire to be able to regulate all of these products that you felt were dangerous for young people. And so this was a strategy to keep young people from having access to both cigarettes um, as well as e-cigarettes. And it was a companion piece to your regulation saying that um, no one under 18 could purchase e-cigarettes and um, I remember I think perhaps Chair Bozovich in particular talking about how the tobacco industry often will make slight changes and so trying to cast a wide net in how you define that. Um, that's my memory of the conversation. Well the good news is we cast a wide net. The bad news is we're getting ready to repeal part of that net and I'm just wondering if you have given any thought to uh, a definition in the ordinance of the term tobacco so that we could retain the prohibition against use of coupons um, for cigarettes, which is what the dominant testimony was about and what I believe at least three commissioners want to make a change on. Uh, but I'm just drawing that narrow issue of, well, there wasn't a whole lot of testimony about the need for coupons for e-cigarette sales. And Chair Bozovich, Commissioner Sorensen, we absolutely could bring back that language on the coupons if, if the board would like to be able to um, narrow that restriction. Uh, whatever is the pleasure of the board, we, that would not be difficult to bring you different language. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions or comments on for staff? Commissioner Farr. Thank you, Commissioner Bozovich. Um, you know, when we passed the tobacco ordinance uh, last year, uh, December, December, um, when I signed it, the ordinance, um, you know, I was uh, adamant about uh, the, the reasons that I, I was interested in, uh, in moving forward with the ordinance, and I remain just as adamant about the reasons, and uh, I'm not going to belabor it too much right now. Um, but, you know, uh, uh, we heard comments earlier from uh, – um, let's see, uh, comments earlier regarding um, – uh, the amount of money we spend on tobacco-related illnesses in Lane County, $258 million, I think, was thrown out. And um, uh, up to 215 calls a month on nicotine poisoning. Um, I mean, these are pretty astounding numbers that we're hearing. And every, every call, you know, every, uh, every dollar spent on medical services based upon cigarettes um, and, and nicotine products are dollars that could be spent elsewhere, could be spent on public safety, could be spent on uh, recreation, could be spent on going on holidays, could be spent on eating nutritious food or opening a new farmer's market across the blocks there. You know, 
every dollar that we spend on that is money that could be spent elsewhere. So it's important that we move forward as strongly as we possibly can and, and lay down the rules as strongly as we, uh, we can at Lane, Lane County. And I remain just as strongly supportive of our tobacco ordinance as I did when we passed it. The changes that we're looking at today are reasonable in nature for a couple of reasons. Uh, you know, one of them is that uh, if, uh, if a retailer is only a few feet away from another retailer and they have a different set of rules that they're operating under, uh, then, you know, that, that makes it, uh, you know, a little bit more difficult for people to play, uh, to operate their business on an, on an even footing with their, with their competitors, and it is a competitive industry. So, um, so if I vote yes on this particular, these particular changes, a lot of it will be based upon the fact that uh, the, the men and women sitting in this room, some of them are back here today, who have testified to us, to us before us in the past, have reasonable requests that we don't create a, an unfair uh, business um, environment in Lane County for them, and I, I understand that. I listen to that. Now, if I vote no on this particular ordinance, uh, the, or the changes to the ordinance, it'll be because I still am as adamant as I as I was that uh, I don't want kids to start smoking. I wish my parents had stopped before they did stop, before smoking killed them. Uh, my children wish that smoke that uh, that uh, their three of their four grandchildren uh, grandparents hadn't ever started smoking, and I wish they hadn't started smoking too, because perhaps they'd be around to see their great-grandchildren being born right now. You know, it, is, it really is a sad, sad situation, and I'm not the only person. In fact, I'm probably, there's probably not one person in this room that has not been affected closely in their family by the effect of nicotine and cigarettes, the addictive nature of nicotine and the carcinogen nature of cigarettes. You know, it's a, uh, it, it, it's a, it's, it's an, it's not an epidemic. You know, it's a horror that we're living with. It's like, you, have you ever read, read the book Watership Down? Anybody read Watership Down? It's about the rabbits who live ne next to the, the, snare, the, uh, the farmers who snare them, and they live with it. They, you know, the snares are just a part of being alive, because every now and then one of us goes away, we don't know where they went. Well, we do know where they went. I know where my mom and dad went. I know where, uh, where my, my uh, mother-in-law went. You know, they, they went to cigarettes. Uh, and the snare, the worship down snare that got them, that so many of us have kind of pushed behind us and we don't talk about, we don't listen to, we don't hear about, you know, we, uh, uh, we would prefer not to think about it. The snare's there, you know, and it's out there. And if you put your head in the wrong hole, it's going to get you. And it's got every one of us. Some of our relatives have been gotten by that watership down snare. And it's, it's something that I'm really, um, yeah, I'm, I'm struggling with my vote on this one, quite frankly, because I really truly understand the business nature, and I really truly understand that that uh, that by by restricting the use of coupons, by restricting the uh, the grandfathering in clause, um, you know, that it has an effect on, on local businesses. That being said, I can't ignore the fact that we're living with this horrible murderer right among us, right in this room here. Commissioner Bozovich talked about the uh, smoke that we couldn't avoid over the weekend, and it was unavoidable. Back in the old field-burning days, we couldn't avoid the days of the field-burning smoke hit uh, Lane County and got sucked in. But we can avoid this. We can avoid sucking this stuff into our lungs. And we can avoid kids getting started on sweet-tasting stuff so that later they're going to suck it into their lungs. We can avoid that, and we have to do everything that we possibly can do, and I, I challenge anybody in this room who disagrees with me that we have to do anything that we can do to prevent kids from smoking and anything that we can do to get people who do smoke today to stop smoking today, if possible. So that being said, once again, I am, I'm struggling with my vote on this because a, a large part of me says we have a business decision here, but a larger part of me says... You know, we have people dying, and people who haven't started smoking yet, people who haven't started smoking yet will die from cigarettes. They haven't even started yet. So that's, that's where my struggle is today, and I uh, thank you for your presentation. Thank you, Dr. Kuzman, for your presentation. Thank you, for, uh, thank you, Christy, for the times we spend in my office talking about this. I think you and I have uh, kind of a kindred spirit on, on where we're going with this. And it's, uh, you know, um, my yes vote is, is for the... the business people in this room, my no vote is for all of the kids, all of the people who haven't smoked, started smoking yet, uh, who are, in fact, going to die from cigarettes, even though they haven't started yet. Commissioner Lykin. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, first of all, I really want to say thank you to all of those who took time out of their day to come and testify, really since day one, 
on, on this issue. And uh, then I would really like, want to say thank you to our staff. And uh, thank you very much for working with us on this. Um, as you know, I, I think since day one, I, I expressed my opinion and uh, where I felt we should be on, on this. I think what's a key here is that this, this ordinance, uh, if we decide to pass this today, this ordinance will basically affect about 25% of Lane County residents. I mean, 75% of the residents in uh, the business community in particular will not be affected. And uh, really from the, from the get-go, that was my whole issue, is uh, I felt like if we were gonna be truly effective, we should really have looked at this more from a global perspective and not just from a um, <clears throat> micro perspective. And I, and I think that's what, what occurred in the very beginning. So I think what, what has happened here is that as we've gone through this discussion, uh, this is where I want to say thank you to staff. I, I think what you did is you worked with us, and I think what we have now is something that's a bit more balanced. Um, this does not take away from my own personal feeling about smoking, and and uh, especially when it comes to our children. I mean, this, this is the part that and it still baffles me today when I see high school-aged kids with a cigarette in their mouth. I, I honestly, I'm looking at this, and there is so much information out there I don't understand this. So um, so I think what we have here today is, I think what this does is, is kind of really sets in motion. And I think what's the key is that I, I think staff should really be, really step up and really realize what we've done here is that Lane County has taken a step and has shown leadership throughout the state. And if the, which I think will come back in the short session, and I think what you're going to see now is more of a statewide perspective on, the, on this particular issue. But this really goes to you, staff, and really say thank you very much and, and what, what you've brought to us. And uh, so I think moving forward, I, I will support this because I think what it does is, is allows those struggling businesses in rural Lane County to continue to move forward. And, and, I, and I think that, that that's going to be important. I think Commissioner Farr said it perfectly. Uh, I, I know the business there <laughs> right off the, the Mohawk River. I mean, it's, it's, I, believe me, I've been in that market many times over the years. And you're exactly right. A half mile down the road, you can, uh, at a, uh, it's, uh, it's, I think it's a 76 station, I think, if memory serves me correct, or a Chevron, one of the two, you can, you can go and buy cigarettes. And you can buy the you can buy the, the what what the original um, the original ordinance entailed would have caused really I, to me economic harm. So I think this is a good first step. I appreciate the work that you put into this. And again, thanks to all the citizens throughout Lane County who testified on this pro con whatever. I think the information was extremely valuable moving forward. And uh, but great job to staff. Thank you so much. Commissioner Stewart. Thanks, Mr. Chair. And uh, I don't know if I have much more to add from what Commissioner Lykin said, but um, I'll, and I may repeat some of it. But um, first of all, I want to thank staff for bringing this back and and uh, being helpful with trying to adjust it. I, I think the the critical piece for me at this point is around fairness. Um, I know that um, this is. Um, is a goal, uh, one of our goals as part of the community health improvement plan to reduce um, the ability, of, you know, hopefully reduce the number of our youth using tobacco products. And um, the piece that wraps around the fairness, and Commissioner Lykin already stated, but I'll restate it, is, is that this really only applies to the unincorporated uh, folks in our community, as he said, about 25% of our, our county. And I, and I understand the passion of, um, uh, are my colleagues and I'm there with them and would support us uh, working towards a county-wide ordinance that's fair for everybody and then we wouldn't have this conversation. So I appreciate uh, taking the time um, to, to uh, try to adjust this so that hopefully our, um, our folks that are in business today, they can continue to be in business without risking putting them out of business. Um, so I think that the tweaks that we've made can make that happen and still show that we're concerned about this, this is a priority, um, and we can move forward with um, potentially some uh, a county-wide ordinance. Um, I just happened to, to be in a meeting yesterday late in the day with the city manager at Cottage Grove and also the 
uh, school district uh, superintendent um, from from South Plains School District. And I just, at the end of our meeting, I took the opportunity to ask him. I said, "What are your what are your feelings and comments? Are you aware of them?" And both of them were well aware of them. So you know, I think we had representatives from South Plains School District that came and testified, uh, encouraged us to adopt this ordinance. And also, the city of Kyes Grove, I think, has been very receptive as considering this. Um, the city manager said that, you, you know, you're correct, Faye, that the tweaks that you're, you have made help it be more palatable within the city limits because some of the things that were included, you know, quite frankly, the cities are going to look at them and say, we can't do this. It's going to uh, negatively impact 75% of our businesses that are located uh, uh, next to parks and all these other places where, where um, youth um, happen to frequent. And so I think that we're on the right path, and, and I believe that um, he said that the only inclusion that he could see at this point that might be considered including in the ordinance was to ban it from ban the use of tobacco products or smoking within parks. So I think we're, we're getting closer, and I'm hopeful that our staff will continue to make that effort. Um, the, the superintendent... You know, reluctantly, she understood um, the balance. Um, I think that she would prefer that we don't make the changes. Um, she was honest about it, but understood that at least, you know, a thousand feet from the schools that um, that she has control over, that's helpful to to her to um, and, and a beneficial. So, um, I think we're on the right track, and I I'm cautiously optimistic that you know staff will work with the cities and we'll be able to consider. A, um, a county-wide implementation of this um, ordinance, uh, hopefully soon, sooner than later. Chair Bozovich, um, Commissioner Stewart, I just wanted to um, assure the whole board and, and you in particular that those conversations with the cities are very important. And um, from a public health perspective, we absolutely want to have uh, the policy be countywide. And a lot of those have been on hiatus while you're working out your final, final language. But uh, between the staff at public health and um, Dr. Ledke and myself, we would anticipate circling back around to all of those cities once we have final language. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I had a quick question, uh, and this is relative to the um, looking at further issues and trying to prevent um, smoking and, and minors and, and smoking cessation in general. We have a um, work discussion, I believe, on an update on the community health improvement plan coming up, and we're going to discuss strategies and all that. Can you kind of just update us on what's coming? I'd be happy to, Chair Bozovich. Uh, September 22nd, I believe, is um, the Tuesday that we've uh, requested, um, at your suggestion, a work session. At this point, uh, we're thinking it's going to be about two hours, so to really give you sufficient time to not only get an update on where the community is with the Community Health Improvement Plan and specifically where the county staff is with the specific priorities you adopted, but also provide enough opportunity to talk about some of the other issues that have been raised at the last several Board of Health meetings. Um, there was a topic around tobacco use in parks or tobacco-free um, county properties. So kind of looking at all of the other parts of the Community Health Improvement Plan and giving you the opportunity, if there are some other things that you would identify for work um, in this next year, that you have the chance to do that. So that will be on the 22nd of September. Excellent. I just wanted to bring that out, that this is not the end of the process if we do adopt this, the, these amendments to the ordinance, um, the original ordinance today under this ordinance. Um, I also just want to make note that as folks came and testified, it was based on the ordinance we had published at that time, which included a definition of tobacco that was all-inclusive, including e-cigarettes. So when retailers were referring to the um, unfair playing field of of having, you know, two different retailers separated by less than a half mile that had different rules relative to coupons and pricing, et cetera, and they referred to tobacco, they were using our definition of that. So to construe that it was only cigarettes they were talking about, I think, is um, a false construction because they were testifying to an ordinance that had a definition of tobacco that was all-inclusive. So I just want to make that clear. Um, is there any other um, questions for staff? If not, I'll entertain a motion on the ordinance. 
Commissioner Stewart. Mr. Chair, I would move approval of Ordinance 15-05 in the matter of amending Lane Code Chapter 9 to address tobacco sale regulation issues related to discount pricing and proximity of sales to locations serving children and fees penalties. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Discussion of the motion. Commissioner Farr. <clears throat> Thank you, Commissioner Bozovich. You know, I'm looking, skipping through some advertising some from a local publication uh, fairly recently. Uh, it's a, a coupon booklet that they put out. It's, I'm, I'm not going to say which publication it is, but uh, it's a coupon booklet that, from one of our weeklies here locally. And it's uh, very expensive coupons in there. You know, some of them, I see that Cornucopia could only afford one-eighth of a page black and white uh, for their coupon. And um, many of the... Many of the uh, uh, advertiser in there. Some of them go up to a quarter of a page. There are a couple that are half a page. But the full color <clears throat> on the inside, first page that you open after the after the uh, first after the uh, cover, uh, full color, beautiful, all natural. You know, we we use all natural. Well, our cars are natural, and the paper this is printed on is natural. Full color, full page. The biggest coupon in the entire booklet, offering a twenty dollar coupon. Uh, up to twenty dollars uh, in coupons is for American Spirit cigarettes. Then you flip to the very back page of that same advertising bu booklet, which is sixteen pages from one of our local weeklies. That uh, the very back page is a full color uh, camel. Now it's not cigarettes; it's these things that you tuck in your mouth, nicotine um, that you tuck in your mouth, which uh, even though it's not smoked, it is a carcinogen also. Full pol full color. So two full color. That is a quarter of the entire. Uh, booklet is devoted full color to cigarettes and t tobacco product, including the largest coupon in the, in the entire booklet. Now, how, how do we curb this? How do we, you know, it's pretty attractive. I'm looking at this one on American Spirit. It's lovely. I mean, I couldn't take a photograph that pretty. And I, I couldn't do any marketing that's that effective. I stopped and looked at it, and it's beautiful. All natural. It's got to be good, right? You know, it's 100% uh, is used in here at some point. You know, it's so it's, uh, but it's not all natural. You know, it's, the, the cigarettes aren't all natural by any means. But uh, and I'm not faulting American Spirit any more than I'm faulting any other cigarette brand. And I'm not fa faulting um, cigarettes any more than I'm faulting any other nicotine purveyor. You know, it's just it's it's in our community, and it's, it's like I said earlier, it's something that uh, we try to hide. We try to forget that our parents and our grandparents aren't going to see their grandchildren and great grandchildren because of these things and if I'm gonna you know if I'm gonna put my money where my, my mouth is we're gonna I'm gonna make help make some of the hard decisions that sometimes aren't as popular as they may be uh, universally but uh, in fairness what's fair you know if what is fair what is fair is it uh, is it fair that my soon-to-be-born grandchild isn't going to see their grandparents their great-grandparents I don't think that's fair because they wouldn't be that old you know I mean they're pretty young so it's, um, that's not fair to me, and the fairness is uh, is far more than uh, than can I sell something that some, can I uh, am I hampered in selling something that somebody down the street is selling? You know, to me, fairness extends far beyond that. So I'm still struggling with my vote on this, and I probably will not make my mind up until until Mr. Mokarajski says, Commissioner Farr. Commissioner Sorensen. Thank you very much. You know, um, one of the interesting things about our democracy is we let certain people vote and certain people can't vote. The big dividing line on the voting is the age of the person. There are other restrictions on who can vote, but in most countries worldwide, the voting age is either 21 or 18. And there have been proposals to allow children to vote and on the premise that they're affected by the decisions that that are made in in a given democracy and so maybe we should let them vote but most of those proposals have been rejected for a variety of reasons and in recent years when the u.s and other major countries in the world lowered the voting age from 21 to 18 it was mainly out of respect for the fact that people that are 18 and 19 and 20 can get conscripted into the military of their country. So the premise was, well, if they're old enough to be conscripted into the military, they might be old enough to vote. But today, we're, we're in one of these 
decisions where we're talking about rolling back or mitigating or doing something different to our ordinance that we enacted to protect children, but the voice of those children politically is not heard because they don't have a right to vote yet. And <clears throat> I'm not really here to recommend that we change all of that in one fell swoop or even propose it. But what I am pointing out is that children are the ones that are most affected by these decisions. So with the, with the multi-billion dollars of marketing that the tobacco industry worldwide puts into trying to keep kids addicted or get them addicted uh, or increase the nicotine content or increase the addictive qualities, <clears throat> um, let the children think that they're playing with a toy or, or having some uh, candy. Uh, and, and one of the methods that they used for the marketing since they've been banned from, from uh, television advertising, at least in the U.S., is, is with these coupons. So the major issue today is whether we're going to allow these coupons or not allow these coupons. And clearly, uh, from what was reported, you know, the amendment that it's before the board that we're about to pass that I won't be voting for um, is to allow those coupons and allow the the use, the, the major use of the multinational tobacco industries to use their main technique for uh, addicting uh, these children and keep their marketing and keep their product going, even though most people know that ultimately those products kill people. So I just think it's it's bad on, on the level of adopting a, a forward-looking uh, ordinance that others would look to and then and turn around and um, change it. It's also bad in that we have the authority to deal with our border issue by enacting an ordinance that is countywide and would affect all retailers equally. And that would be a really substantial use of our power to help children um, through our power. So um, thank you for this opportunity to uh, voice my opposition. Commissioner Stewart. <clears throat> Thanks, Mr. Chair. And, you know, I, I respect the comments that were made, but quite frankly, this ordinance, the way it is today, doesn't stop those ads. It doesn't stop the 250,000 people that live within Eugene and Springfield from being able to see those ads and be able to use those coupons within the stores. I, I, I appreciate that. And the, pro, the, the, the point I'm trying to represent here is, is that I represent rural Lane County, and they're hanging on by a thread, folks. Stores are, have uh, seen businesses, uh, uh, lumber companies close down. They've seen their businesses um, you know, fall in half or less. They're struggling to make it. And I guess my question is to me is, is that, you know, yeah, we might have a minimal impact on um, 100,000 people with this ordinance, probably mostly a negative impact from the standpoint we're probably not going to stop people from living in, around the outside the Cottage Grove from driving into the Cottage Grove uh, market and purchasing these products with this ordinance. So they're not going to be stopped from being present within our school system down there or within the ability of our youth. You know, the real answer here is really to tackle something that is countywide. And I, I guess that's what I'm respectfully asking my colleagues to do here is to understand that, you know, I'm not opposed to doing something countywide and trying to make meaningful impact, but it has to be fair to everybody and I think equally represented. And unfortunately, you know, to, you know, to let our passions out on this, I think we're being just a little bit misguided at this point as to really what the true impacts are going to be. Um, and may, maybe if we take the approach that, yeah, maybe this might impact one or 10 or 15 youth from not using it, I guess that, that's a plus, and maybe that's what we should be trying to do. But I think we could be more effective if we understood that well, let's try to do something countywide and not have some of these adverse impacts that um, we're experiencing. And let's not, um, you know, put rural 
Lane County, East Lane County, and West Lane County into any more jeopardy than, and, and difficulty than we've already placed them upon or the federal government or whoever we deem has, has um, cast the die in, in their, um, uh, seeing their communities um, you know, essentially go from being pretty prosperous down to um, we're hanging on by a thread. And that's, that's what I'm trying to address here. And I, I don't want to be disrespectful. I think all of your comments are right on the mark. I, I don't want my, my kids uh, uh, thinking that they want to start vaping because uh, they want to uh, have a uh, Girl Scout mint cookie flavor to it. I mean, I, I don't want to see that, and I don't want any other kids to. But then I also want to be re respectful of what are we truly achieving here and where, where, what are some of the negative impacts, and I, I think we can do a better job. And I'm committed to making sure that we do a better job. And that was, you know, if I go back, clear back to my comments probably a year, year and a half ago, that's why I really was hoping that we could do this countywide, get cities of support before we enacted. I don't, we wouldn't be in this position, in, in quite honestly. So, um, you know, I guess that will be a learning lesson for me to be more adamant that let's, let's do a little better job on the process end. Mr. Chair, I'll pass. I, I think my, cons my comments have been very consistent since day one. Thank you. Yeah, and I, I just want to appreciate everybody's comments. And, and, you know, I think when we talk about what's fair, um, we have to think about the full unintended consequences of an action we're taking. And, and I think Commissioner Stewart outlined this very well. There is a consequence if we leave the ordinance as is, and that is we will set up a situation where rural unincorporated shops will have a considerable um, disadvantage competitively with shops that are inside city limits. And the result could be closures of those rural stores, which is going to result in unemployment. You know, and I've talked previously about the effects of poverty and health outcomes. That it's actually a, a bigger indicator of health outcomes than tobacco use is. I've also, you know, one of the things we're charged as a board in our land use portion of our powers is to try and reduce vehicle miles traveled. So we start having the mom and pop rural grocery stores shut down. Then we're requiring people to drive in and out of urban centers to get the, the one item they need to finish cooking dinner. So we're adding to the vehicle miles traveled, which is an issue as far as health concerns, and that's why it's built into some of our land use rules. And, and in general, just food availability out in rural areas, you know, and all that. So there, there's a whole bunch of unintended consequences health-wise to leaving the, this, this way. The way to deal with this is, and, and we noted we're going to start this conversation in less than a month, of what should we do maybe in the countywide. And we're also going to have an update here in our regular board meeting on our legislative um, past session and start thinking about upcoming legislation, legislative efforts this board would like to, to go after. But I strongly support the idea of moving forward on a countywide ordinance. But we need to do that in collaboration with our city partners um, instead of trying to have us just dictate to them. I think we need to move forward together. Um, we saw last summer what happens when one jurisdiction tries to dictate to another um, policy with a sick leave ordinance in the city of Eugene. I don't want to repeat that effort. So I, I'm all for moving forward on a countywide ordinance that could contain some of these provisions and eliminate those, those uh, competitive <clears throat> issues that we're setting up and also maybe start thinking a little bit further down the road. Commissioner Sorensen brought up the whole issue of age of purchase and I would fully support a countywide ordinance that moved that moved over a three-year phase in the age of, of legal purchase of tobacco products as we define them broadly to 21 and I think that would have a whole lot more impact on on kids accessing tobacco products than some of the coupon pricing and other issues we're talking about here today so I'm going to support the amendment it's Amendments I actually suggested when we adopted the ordinance last December. In fact, almost verbatim exactly what I suggested last December because I saw these issues in advance and 
the emotions of the moment in trying to deal with kids having access to e-cigarettes um, overrode waiting a month to try and uh, correct the ordinance. So here we are nine months later fixing the things that, that I suggested nine months ago. So, And we could have maybe just gone over to another reading and passed it in January and we'd have been done. So. I appreciate staff for coming back with all this. I appreciate their understanding of the concerns, the legal constraints, everything from the, the issue about and community and, and the issue of, of the state's preemption on local taxation of tobacco products to, you know, the, the location standards and the grandfathering and the, and the possible takings issues that come with making a store have no value. Um, so. I really appreciate everything that everybody's put into this. I appreciate the, the emotion that's around it. You know, I, you know, Commissioner Farr is perfectly correct. I don't think there's a person in this room that hasn't had somebody affected by cancer related to or heart disease related to tobacco products. So, um, you know, it, it's, it's a, a serious issue. I'll be voting in support of the ordinance um, because I think it's, the correct thing to do to establish that level playing field right now, go as far as we can with unincorporated um, regulations, and then look to further steps to go countywide where we can level the playing field and take further action in the future to prevent um, minors from taking up this addictive and destructive habit. So with that, any further uh, comments to the motion? Seeing hearing none, this is an ordinance. Will you call the roll, please? Commissioner Sorensen? No. Commissioner Stewart? Aye. Aye. Commissioner Lichen? Aye. Commissioner Farr? No. Commissioner Bozovich? Aye. Motion passes 3 2 with Commissioners Farr and Sorensen in dissent. Thank you very much. And that ends our business for the joint meeting of the Board of Health and Board of Commissioners. So I'm going to adjourn that meeting. And I'm going to call to order the regular meeting of the Board of Commissioners for Tuesday, August 25th. And the first item of business is adjustments to the agenda. Are there any adjustments to the agenda? I will note we do need an executive session today. Seeing and hearing none, that moves us on to public comments. Um, we did have some people address the board prior to the, the, to the joint meeting, but if there's somebody that wishes to address the board um, in our regular meeting, um, I'll take those comments now. No one wishes to address the board. Then we'll move on to Commissioner's uh, response to public comments and or other issues in remonstrance. Commissioner Lichen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I must say this is one of those times when it's, I feel very proud to be born and raised in Roseburg, Oregon. And uh, so I just want to, again, make mention to uh, National Guard uh, Guardsman uh, Alex Scar uh, Scarlatos, uh, who is actually, uh, his parents actually live in Roseburg, and he's from Roseburg. And, uh, for really uh, being what I call one of the, as we now know, four, because one of the individuals is actually in the hospital, but one of the four uh, heroes, I, I will flat out call them heroes, had potentially stopped an absolutely uh, horrible situation on a train in France, uh, given the combinations like he was from the, from the French president. And, uh, and he, he and the two, two of the individuals involved, not even hesitating, but stopping this individual that uh, the French government is calling absolute terrorism. And so I just want to say thank you very much to Guardsman uh, Scarlatos for, for his involvement in that. And also I want to say thank you to Tim Boyle, and who is the CEO of Columbia Sportswear. I don't know if people are aware of this, but Tim offer, authorized his plane to go pick up the mothers of the three to make sure that they were in France. And here, so he his plane flew the mothers of the three individuals from the United States to France because they were unable to secure a flight to be in Paris to be a part of their their son's uh, 
a combination. So this is a big, so of course Columbia Sportswear, located in Oregon, another Oregon company involved in this. So, but a big thank you to Tim uh, to authorize that. Uh, what an incredible gesture to, uh, to uh, on on his part. And uh, but. Uh, pretty incredible just to uh, when you read and witness or read and, and hear about it and even from the eyewitnesses about the lack of hesitation that went in as, as we know now four of the individuals. One is actually a college professor who was also involved and suffered a wound and is currently in the hospital. But thank you to the three, the four Americans involved in that who took down this, this uh, act of terrorism that the French government has now proclaimed that was an actual act of terrorism. So big thank you to, uh, to all, all four. Thank you. Commissioner Farr. Thank you, Mr. Chair. A couple of things I wanted to mention today. The first thing, I'm going to pass these photos along to uh, my fellow commissioners and keep one myself. You know, um, over the weekend, uh, our, uh, the Nightingale Health Sanctuary moved their uh, homeless camp, uh, their encampment uh, from behind the MLK, uh, uh, MLK Boulevard, behind our behavioral health facility, over to uh, yeah, over to uh, River Road and Northwest Expressway. This is a picture of the camp as it's now been set up. And if you take a look at this, um, it looks pretty orderly. It looks um, uh, all, all the uh, all the residences, we'll call them residences because that's indeed what they are, are very well ordered. They're all up off the ground, um, uh, very neat. And you'll notice that the, there are hoop houses over the top of the tents providing additional shelter for the people who are living in the tents. That's a little bit about the, uh, about the camp, about the uh, Nightingale Health Sanctuary Camp, which is on county property. It is uh, administered basically by the city of Eugene, but the uh, nonprofit Nightingale Health Sanctuary are the ones who are, uh, are actually um, uh, monitoring the daily operations of the camp. If you take a look at this, it's very different to some of the uh, other encampments that you may encounter. Very strict health rules involved here. Uh, they're, uh, they operate on uh, rules that were actually prescribed by our health department. And, uh, and really, if you go in there, the people are happy living there. And in fact, this one, uh, this one camp, which, is, which has now been relocated, 17 of the people who have been living here, who were living here, have been relocated into permanent housing. Now that's what we want. We want people to move through into permanent housing, and we need to find different ways to provide permanent housing, but this is a really positive thing. Mr. Mokarhyski, one thing I like about the new location is a mixed blessing, but I, I do like the fact that it's in... Uh, is front and center. People have an opportunity to drive by thousands of people daily, th sometimes thousands of people in an hour, go by and see what a well-organized, secure, safe, and uh, healthy camp, a relatively healthy camp, um, it looks like. And it, uh, it, really is a, it really is a testimony to what can work as far as helping provide living accommodations for homeless people and helping people to move through homelessness. So thank you very much for that. Mm -hmm. uh, the second thing I'll talk about is... Uh, Regarding our Operation 365, we are housing homeless veterans. I've had an opportunity to talk this week to landlords who have uh, given veterans opportunities to uh, to live in their in their rental units. Uh, <clears throat> some of them by reducing first, last, and security, allowing for monthly payments on their on their uh, residences. Some of them uh, foregoing some of the background checks that uh, occasionally are involved. But I've had a chance to talk to a whole lot of uh, landlords this week and. Uh, thank them personally for the fact that they are stepping forward and, uh, and helping with the homeless uh, veterans issue that, uh, you know, by the end of uh, November this year, our goal is to have housed 365 veterans, one for every day in the year. So we, uh, uh, we're well, well on our way to, to accomplishing that goal, and I, I really expect by December 1st we'll be able to say we made it. We housed 365 homeless veterans. Uh, the third thing I'd like to talk about is SNAP, that is um, uh, the – new term for what used to be called food stamps. We, uh, a lot of, a lot of um, families in Lane County rely on food stamps for nutrition for, uh, to buy food that otherwise they would, may not be able to buy. Um, and it's, uh, you can spend the food stamps in stores. The, the money that is spent, the food stamp money that is spent, is recirculated in our local economy, particularly when it's spent with local vendors. And over the weekend, I had a chance to, uh, uh, Sarah Majewski and our, uh, our uh, economics department, or economy department, I can, help me with this, Ms. Mokarhyski. It's uh, economic, economic, de 
Community and Economic Development. We're Thank you. Over uh, we presented a check to Farmers Market for $5,000. $5,000 is for their SNAP matching program where at, uh, people who have SNAP and uh, Lane County, due to the efforts of Food for Lane County and Oregon Food Bank and others, has a, a very high rate of people who are eligible for food stamps actually receiving the food stamps and the SNAP benefits and spending them locally. Uh, uh, Farmers Market has a matching program where when people um, use, use the SNAP coupons to buy, they're uh, somewhat more expensive every now and then than, than uh, what, where you can buy in supermarkets with produce, which is uh, locally grown and nutritious, then they'll match it. And so people get uh, twice double their money for it. So I'd like to thank everyone in Lane County for the $5,000 that was put into the SNAP, the Farmer's Market, Market Program over the weekend. And the final thing, if you indulge me for just one second, I'm going to take a drink of Eugene tap water. Mm. Wow, that is better than soda. Uh, I happen to fizz mine because I have one of those little fizzy machines at home. This is Eugene tap water, and I can't buy anything better than that. There is no money that can buy anything better than Eugene or Springfield tap water. Uh, all comes from the McKenzie River. Springfield's well fields are Mackenzie River water. Uh, uh, Eugene's that happens to be drawn from the McKenzie River. And uh, yesterday I had a chance to talk with them. Um, with Janine Parisi from uh, uh, eWeb, and they are starting a program right now. <laughs> so you can have your own bottle, or you can have this bottle here, and it's called a partnership to cultivate a culture of preparedness. Now, here at uh, the Board of Commissioners, we talk a lot about being prepared for disaster. One of the most important, probably the most important way to prepare for disaster is to have water on hand, drinking water on hand. And it's recommended that everybody has three gallons of water. That is enough for three days, one gallon per day per person. That's for your drinking needs and your sanitation needs. This is a three gallon, this is the three day supply of water for me should we uh, run out of uh, flowing water in our taps. Better than drinking out of the back of the toilet. You know, but, uh, so keep fresh water on hand. Um, we've, we've talked about it quite often, uh, whether it be an earthquake, a fire, a flood, other things that may, uh, may interrupt our water supply. Keep three gallons per person on hand. That's three-day supply per person in your household. Also a gallon per pet. They are less fussy about drinking out of the back of the toilet, by the way, than human beings are and should be. So uh, thank you, Janine, for bringing this to me yesterday. And thank you for this, which we all should be drinking lots of every single day. Commissioner Sorensen. Uh, thank you very much. Um, this uh, past weekend, the um, Lane County Farmers Market celebrated the 100th birthday of the uh, Farmers Market in downtown Eugene. It originally started as a Eugene Producers Market and was in place for 70 or so years, and then it went by the wayside for a while and then came back as the in its current form, Lane County Farmers Market. And I um, uh, just want to thank uh, Commissioner Farr and uh, Sarah Case and others from the county involved in presenting the Farmers Market with a check for $5,000 to assist in their efforts. Um, I think the celebration was, was good in part because of the tremendous uh, economic engine that the farmer's market um, spins off and is a vital part of our food and beverage economy. And as, as has been mentioned, the farmer's market, uh, as well as stores, regular grocery stores, uh, are eligible to receive uh, uh, SNAP benefits. And SNAP is the acronym for the program formerly known as Food Stamp. So it provides food or access to food to people that don't have enough money to buy food. And a very large percentage, maybe 20% uh, of Lane County is receiving those benefits. So it's a very significant population. And, and I think part of the excitement associated with the 100th anniversary is the fact that there's a lot of research that shows that people will buy better food, they will eat better, they will have better health outcomes if they increase the amount of fresh fruits and vegetables that they can buy at 
uh, farmer's markets. So uh, Lane County Farmer's Market is, is, is working on an effort to double the amount of food that can be purchased with SNAP benefits because they're federal. That's what federal tax dollars are partially being used for. But if we can have a local match and double the amount of food that people can buy, fresh food, good food, then it won't just benefit the farmers who sell it. It will also benefit the people that are struggling to feed their families on the SNAP benefits. So I think it's a, it's a great partnership, and I'm, I'm glad our economic development staff is involved with the uh, development of farmers markets, not just the uh, Lane County Farmers Market in downtown Eugene, but farmers markets throughout the county. Thanks. Thanks. Any other remonstrance? Seeing none, we'll move on to uh, emergency business. Any emergency business today? No. Thank you. Then we'll move to the consent calendar, which is uh, routine items that we passed um, in a single motion. If folks uh, want to see what the details of what we're passing, they can go to our website and click on the view materials for each item. And uh, this uh, will be passed without discussion. Is there a motion to approve the consent calendar? Mr. Chair, I'd move approval of the consent calendar. Second. It's been moved and seconded. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. And I just want to make a quick note um, to our uh, district attorney who walked in the door, um, or, or I guess an acting district attorney, or what's the interim, what is it, or is it, I guess it's officially district attorney. You're either a district attorney or you're, you're not. not. Yeah. <laughs> I, I get confused yeah. about these appointed positions. Yeah. <laughs> but um, just that, uh, you know, part of our consent calendar was to add um, another staffer to her office, and part of that was because of actions she took upon assuming the role of district attorney um, and how she backfilled her position and, and reductions in, in cost um, and, and managed to free up that amount of money and fill that position. So she's already making positive change there and increasing our ability to uh, prosecute um, folks and hold them accountable in Lane County. So I just want to appreciate the efforts of uh, Ms. Perlow. So thank you. So with that, we'll move on to uh, county administration announcements. Thank you, Mr. Chair. You covered one of the things I wanted to point out, so thank you for uh, sharing that information about our new district attorney and uh, really pleased with uh, the work that she's doing there and doing everything we can to identify limited resources to deal with the uh, backlog of caseload in the district attorney's office. A couple of other items I wanted to update you on briefly, and I know we want to get to the legislative update and then exec session. Um, it, we had public comment this morning uh, from a couple individuals regarding our parks and the master plan and large events task force, and I think that's timely. As I was planning to um, update the board on this, I had an opportunity to go with our staff a couple weeks ago and tour a number of parks and engage with our employees in the field. Uh, and of course, it's very impressive. The 70 recreational sites, 4,300 acres of parkland that Lane County is responsible for maintaining and providing great recreational opportunities for our residents and visitors uh, from the Oregon coast to the Cascade Mountain Range. Five campgrounds, 229 campsites uh, with 78% summer occupancy and 62% annual occupancy, uh, 15 reservable picnic facilities at five locations, uh, water access at 37 sites uh, throughout Lane County, including five developed swim areas, beach access at three locations, 400 moorage slips at three marina locations, two of which I was able to see and a lot of investments that we've been able to make uh, in improving uh, the marina slips and generating more revenue for our parks. Uh, we have more than 2,400 moorings each year. We put more than $100,000 per year uh, that's dedicated to natural areas and preservation and enhancement uh, of our parks and natural areas. Uh, a number of, about a dozen major events that we host, there's been a lot of discussion about large events. I think it's important to note that the vast majority, almost exclusively these events are recreation based. They're half marathons, marathons, triathlons, um, 
things that are really positive activities for our residents and visitors. Uh, bike races, the Mushroom Festival, the Wildflower Festival, which at Mount Pisgah that I was able to attend this past spring, uh, Elaine County Park Celebration, uh, so a number of wonderful events there, and, and I'll touch in a, in a minute about the um, Large Events Task Force and the process that we have going there. We have a $3.6 million budget, and $1.4 million of that is for uh, materials and services and, and maintenance. Nine full-time employees, so 4,300 acres of land at 70 sites, 229 campgrounds, and we have nine full-time employees to do all that maintenance that stretches from the coast to the Cascades, and it's frankly astonishing to me how we are able to, with such limited staff, maintain a really quality park system that we want to continue to do. We do staff up in the summer with 17 temporary seasonal employees seasonally, and it's a really cost-effective model uh, where we're not paying uh, the fringe benefit load for those employees who are able to do a lot of maintenance uh, during the summer months. One of our efforts, and then I would say uh, 1.5 million visitors to our parks annually. All 50, they come from all 50 states and 25 countries. That's a, just another astonishing fact. And we don't often talk about our park system because it is underfunded and we have $17 million in deferred maintenance that we have to deal with. But I think that our, our staff is doing a great job at using limited resources to maintain uh, that vast network of really outstanding parks and campgrounds and water access that we have. One of our goals, and we talked about this in the budget this year, uh, that I'm sure will be a topic again as we head into next year's budget is uh, how we continue to be self-sufficient, financially self-sufficient in our parks arena. And we're setting a goal uh, to be financially self-sufficient within the next few years. And our goal is to remove the need for use of the car rental tax in parks. And so looking at making additional investments like we've done at Armitage Park, uh, where one of the best uh, ribbon cuttings that I participated in in a couple decades was the opening of the restroom, shower, and laundry facility at Arm Armitage Park. Uh, but it really is an outstanding facility. We leveraged 50% of the cost of that construction was from the state. And it gave us the ability, uh, and that, that campground is packed um, throughout the summer. It's packed, and so we need to per expand on those opportunities to generate revenue for our park system and make it more financially self-sufficient as the tax revenue that we collect and dedicate for that is uh, being pulled in different directions. So with that, I also wanted to respond to just a couple of the public comments, and I will follow up and meet with um, Ms. Hoover and Ms. Otani uh, with this information, but there were some comments about the draft master plan and, and uh, concern that I heard was that there wasn't enough openness or concern about openness and transparency and feedback for the process. So I want to make sure we get the record straight. The draft uh, parks master plan, and it is a draft, uh, it has not even left the park advisory committee. It's still in the park advisory committee. It is uh, currently in a several month public comment period. So the public is welcome now to act, go to our website and provide comments on that draft plan. There's a link to submit comments online. We also have five regional meetings that are scheduled between September 10th and October 8th. Public comment on the Parks Master Plan will be open uh, until the end of October. And I think it's important to know, I believe the last update on the Parks Master Plan is 20 to 25 years. So it's long overdue. And our staff and our Park Advisory Committee has gone through a long and extensive process to get this updated to priority to do it because it's a couple decades out of date. And you really should be updating master plans every five years or so. Um, so we will continue that public comment period, but I encourage any members of our community who are interested in commenting to go online, to contact us, to attend one of the five scheduled public sessions that we have. And of course, it will go to our Planning Commission and here to the board for comment. Uh, and approval um, before it is in effect. The other uh, comment that was made was in regards to the naming of parks and Emerald Meadows in particular. The uh, Emerald Meadows area, as I understand it, was named in 2012. Uh, it's my understanding we do not have a process when we name internal areas of existing parks. So an area of a park, Emerald Meadows, is an area of uh, Mount Pisgah and, and uh, the 
the larger Mount Pisgah area in Howard Buford uh, Park, and so we don't have a policy there. I think there was an effort made to, from a marketing standpoint to have a name that better reflected uh, that area. That's something certainly that you know we can revisit if there's a desire to do so. Uh, it is my understanding that there is a process if we're looking at naming a park or an area after uh, a name of an individual, uh, and that there is a public process included there. Um, so I think that's everything on the public comments. And again, we'll follow up with Ms. Hoover and, and Ms. Otani on that and uh, make sure that, that but we are committed to openness and transparency, making sure that we receive public comment on uh, all of these efforts. And I think our staff has done a nice job. On the Large Events Task Force, that is a process that is nearing completion. Um, I'll be given an opportunity to review the recommendations and the work of that group, and then it will come to the board, and we will have presentation from our staff and from the committee, um, and so there will be a significant public process there. As the board knows, we've had public comment on that effort uh, through our Engage Lane County website and our general website and a number of uh, uh, public meetings that are held there. Um, I think I'll end there because I know we want to get uh, through the rest of the meeting unless you have any other questions or comments for me. Any questions for the administrator? Seeing none, then we'll move on to item <coughs> 6B, which is a report on the 2015 Oregon Legislature. From, we have Alex Kyler and Sarah Chinsky. Mr. Kyler. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Alex Kyler, your intergovernmental relations manager. Um, Mr. Chair, you have a, uh, uh, and commissioners, you have a board packet in front of you that outlines our report here. Um, I think, uh, given your, uh, if I could ask Mr. Chair a question about time, we probably, we had asked for an hour to do this. I don't, I think you were trying to get an exec session in before lunch. If we can. Do um, you want to? I mean, we've got probably 30 minutes for each of us. Um, we could we could adjust if you'd like. Um, I'll look to the, the. I know the exact session is not a, a, a lengthy one, um, so we, I would let's try to steam through this. Yeah, let's try and steam okay. through this and see where we are. Whether we uh, go to lunch and come back for exact session or not, we'll, we'll determine when we see how far we get with this. So. All right, well, my presentation is going to outline um, the outcomes of our legislative priorities as well. I'll hit on a couple of other things that we did uh, during, what, that we did focus on during the legislat legislative session. Uh, Sarah is going to cover uh, marijuana policy strictly um, as soon as I get done with this. You have a packet with a board memo. There's one thing I would like uh, the board to pay uh, attention to, which was under item 3B, which is policy, policy issues. It has been our practice that if we've got a previously established priority and we haven't been successful with it in Salem, it sort of stays on the list as one of our priorities. So in terms of the direction that I'm uh, uh, feeling, I, I would be going into the short session with an attempt to you know, continued conversations with our existing priorities that we either did not get introduced or we got introduced and they died for whatever reason. And uh, uh, there's a couple of places where I'll point those out as we go through this. So you have an attachment A that I hope looks somewhat familiar to you. These were the adopted priorities. Um, this first group uh, we established those back in August at one of your regular scheduled board meetings, August 2014, in advance of the 15 session. There's no particular order to these. These were just the, what we adopted as legislative priorities. We then had another meeting um, in uh, 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 January, late January 15, where we added a f several more priorities. So. I'll get through these as quickly as I can. The first one was we were seeking a, just a special appropriation for the DA's office. Obviously, there's been a lot of discussion at the board level about how to uh, bolster funding for our DA. We'd seen in the uh, previous session that Marion County had gotten uh, sort of an earmark due to the presence of the state hospital 
we tried to see if we could get something similar for Lane County due to the presence of the new hospital here. Um, I think we did everything right in terms of trying to position that into the right hands. It just didn't show up in the end of session budget bills. Um, and there, there wasn't other, Marion County did not get another special dispensation. Um, in most of the end of session bills, you just didn't see this kind of sort of specialized earmark generally. So um, something that we can continue to, certainly continue to talk to legislature about in terms of our uh, VA funding needs. There was, uh, um, uh, I think on number two, we were seeking a special appropriation for territorial highway, uh, an ongoing project of the county. The um, we had just hoped that we would position that project within what we expected to be a transportation package during the session. The transportation package really faltered early, uh, very early in the session. Within essentially the first two weeks, it was clear that the transportation package was going to be in trouble. It was revived much later in the session with commitments from um, leadership to try to get something done before the close of session. And unfortunately, um, after the first hearing on, uh, January, on June 24th, um, it, that, that failed to advance. The good news was that territorial funding was actually in that uh, proposal. And it was, it was really quite good for territorial. There was uh, several lane kind of projects, uh, safety improvements along Main Street and Springfield, safety improvements along uh, 26 from um, Eugene to Florence, and Territorial Highway were all in there. Um, so we were, we had a pretty active interest in that measure. Um, ultimately, it was clear that there was gonna be some problems getting that uh, uh, proposal through the House. So the Senate seemed to be pretty interested in it. The House just uh, was gonna be a barrier. Item three, um, we were trying to figure out a way to get some CTE funding dedicated over to the Lane Workforce Partnership. Um, I think we, we, this was our first effort at this. Uh, good conversations, we sort of got ourselves, um, at least the coalition that's been involved with CTE, this is Career and Technical Education Funding, um, was, uh, I think, interested in what we had to say. We probably were not involved enough with that coalition from the get-go to really um, have our proposal uh, make it through to the end of the session. And given that we were, in a way, competing with school funds, the school lobby, the educational lobby, came out strongly opposed to our proposal. So we really uh, faced an uphill battle with legislators in trying to advance it. Nonetheless, we did get a hearing um, in the Senate Committee on Workforce who did move it to Senate Finance. Uh, Senate Finance didn't hold a work session on the bill and it failed to advance. We tried uh, a couple of things to position ourselves for a budget note and ultimately um, you know, had a really good conversation with the governor's staff where we focused on trying to um, emphasize the need for the legislature when it appropriates money into a variety of programs, sometimes there's not much feedback that the legislature gets about how effective those dollars are. And that was one of the things that we felt pretty strongly about with the Lane Workforce Partnership, that they would have been able to provide good data back to the legislature about how effective these dollars could have been. So um, more conversations to come on that one. Uh, I think that's a good example of an effort that we had it as a priority. We got some conversations going, it didn't advance, but it's probably worth it for us to continue those conversations. Item four um, was uh, our attempt to close a little loophole hole that existed um, and was identified actually at the board a couple of years ago where um, the uh, lane code was amended such that we could not regulate um, the sale of used firearms outside of uh, uh, city limits. And um, we managed to get some, some language into a bill that actually came out of the House, um, passed the House, but, um, uh, um, excuse me, came out of the Senate just fine, uh, but ran into some problems in the House. Um, 
this board, I think, is very aware of Senate Bill 941, the background check bill. There was a number of, of promises made in, in Salem to do some fixes to that, to that measure, and uh, Senate Bill 315 happened to have the right relating to language, got caught up in that, and became a fix-it bill for Senate Bill 941. And so our language got stripped out, something else got added in. Uh, that something else failed to advance, so uh, it was sort of disappointing for us. Um, Chairman Barker, who chairs the uh, uh, House Judiciary, did promise to uh, introduce something during the short session to try to close that loophole once again. So we'll see how that uh, that evolves for the short session. The good news here is that we did we did again um, build a little bit of a coalition. The City of Portland, um, City of Eugene, both very interested in in this uh, in this particular issue and are well aware of the problems with that loophole. Um, item five was something that we uh, uh, noticed during our public safety levy, which was there was a bit of a disconnect between ballot measure language and what the sort of the promotion of the measure suggested with respect to revenue generation. We got some language uh, for now the mandatory ballot measure language uh, previously said this is based on an estimate by the assessor. New language uh, will say based on an estimate including compression, uh, 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 collection, and early, uh, the early discount rate. So we've, we've, we've got some additional guidance for assessors as they tell folks uh, who are writing ballot measures how much money these measures are going to, uh, to generate. Uh, that was introduced by Representative Lively and um, was of his bills the first one to pass both chambers. So he was, he was pretty uh, excited to have that one come, come through. Um, item six, motor voter registration. This is one we talked about a lot. Uh, I think the board was, was pretty vocal on this particular issue, um, and thus so was I in Salem. Um, we testified on a, on a couple of fronts on this bill, um, and I think really managed to get, there were some interesting statements on the floor um, when it came to a vote that, that suggested there were some promises being made for funding, and ultimately there is funding for the measure for counties, um, sort of a, a direct appropriation for half of the money, and then the other half going to the e-board so that the e-board will receive a, a report from the Secretary of State and parse out dollars as necessary in the second, uh, in the second half of this, this effort. Um, courthouse funding item seven, um, you know, I think we did everything right. I had thought we'd done everything right in terms of uh, being um, uh, generating information at the right times, being at the hearings. We had a good collaboration between us and the courts. Um, we had worked with the Association of uh, Oregon Counties to be on the list in the uh, Chief Justice's package and uh, there was a lot of surprises at the end of the day when we weren't, in, weren't on the list. And uh, I'm still not exactly sure what happened. Our proposal was slightly different than the others in that it was um, for planning dollars, not, not pure construction dollars, and that might have had something to do with it. The good news here is, is that the bonds that are being issued for courthouse funding will not be issued until last bond sale in the biennium at any rate. And so, We've got an opportunity to still get ourselves on the list without any changes in the in the in the revenue generation if we can manage to get this issue onto the uh, legislature's radar screen for 2017. And those efforts are I'm undertaking those right now. Um, CAFA funding is item uh, A. CAFA funding. Um, we are not. Uh, we were not successful in getting the 5.2 million general fund back into the CAFA fund. Um, the, the legislature did allocate 33.6 million dollars for CAFA uh, for the counties. That's slightly down from the past two biennia. So we've, we're seeing continued sort of erosion in uh, assessment funding, and uh, I think this is a story that will continue to play out where they're just, we're just not getting enough dollars into the uh, assessor's office to really allow them to be uh, excellent collectors of tax revenue. And, uh, I think that's still an issue that will play out in the legislature. Um, the the uh, interesting thing there is even the Department of Revenue was having some problems getting their, uh, their 
pertinent staff funded, and for whatever reason, the legislature gave that appropriation to the e-board, so, so for further conversation with the department about how to fund the staff who work with counties to make sure tax collections occur. Number nine is state sick leave response. Uh, there were two bills that got passed, Senate Bill 454 and Senate Bill 968. We were seeking um, uh, a preemption of the statutory authority of local governments to set terms and conditions of employment. Senate Bill 454 um, does have a preemption <coughs> with specific to sick leave. So it does have language that says sick leave, not terms and conditions of employment. Senate Bill 968 is not a permanent preemption. It's a temporary preemption, but it does um, uh, provide that local governments may not pass uh, ordinances related to um, uh, temporary uh, works, or excuse me, flexible work schedules, so uh, schedule requirements. Item 10, uh, ongoing conversations and good conversations about the nexus between public safety and mental health. Um, there was, I thought we had done some good work to get um, a draft bill created that was, uh, Senator Przanski helped us uh, uh, get into the Legislative Council and get drafted. Unfortunately, um, we were unable to get that bill introduced. There were some hiccups with the Senate President's Office who had sort of a, a different approach planned. Um, I think that, that that different approach didn't quite work out as well as he had hoped. Um, we did see uh, Chairman Greenlick of the House Health Care Committee who was instrumental in your earlier presentation of that public health work. So Chairman Greenlick really shepherded through two sessions this focus on public health. He's feeling that work got accomplished and suggested that their next target is this nexus between mental health and public safety. And so I think we'll see a lot of work during this interim and over the course of the next couple sessions, um, at least with respect to his committee, I'm working on this particular issue. We did, um, uh, finally, number 11, the filling the gap in youth mental health services. Um, we actually did get a specific earmark of $250,000 for a project in Lane County to have uh, a new, sh um, new operation over at the Serber Youth Campus where uh, kids who are at risk of getting involved with the uh, uh, criminal justice system, so these are kids who have not been adjudicated yet or, or in police involved, um, will ha as, and especially those kids who are also in foster care. This is a, a center where they will be able to have um, sort of a timeout, get some wraparound services. Uh, we're really uh, feeling pretty good about it. Nice partnership between Lane County and the Department of Human Services to get this done. And. Um, um, We've had, a, we've had several meetings about how to now implement that, and I think you'll, you'll hear more about how, how that will uh, evolve within the next couple of weeks. We've got some spending authority or, or grant authority that the administrator has to ask you for, and so that'll be, that'll be coming uh, shortly. The next section was the reaffirmation of existing priorities. Um, there's a couple things here that I wanted you to note. The strikethroughs mean that uh, I just didn't find an opportunity to get a bill introduced. There just wasn't a way to get it done during this session. And so um, that's when you see a strike through, that's what it means. It just I just couldn't find an avenue for that kind of work. Uh, but item two, family mediation. This has been something that's been ongoing for several sessions where we've been trying to find money for um, uh, family mediation. We tried a couple of different approaches this session and were unsuccessful, unfortunately. Um, we are back to our, did manage to do the fallback position, which is allowing for some sharing of an appropriation that goes to law libraries to be um, moved over to family mediation. And so that work uh, will come to you in a, um, supplemental budget uh, session where you'll see a little bit of a shift from the law library appropriation over to family mediation. Um, item three was on the CHIP. It was a, a part of the CHIP um, priorities, which was additional funding for the farm to school program. Um, we actually got quite a bit more money uh, this session for the farm to school program. You may have heard there was some radio shows 
sort of on this. Um, I think last week I heard yeah. a bit of a buzz about it. Um, people are pretty excited by the increase in the, in the state funds for that program. Uh, items five and six are somewhat have been grouped together. We've had uh, um, these mining issues in the county, and uh, we really did manage to get a couple of these across the finish line this session. Senate Bill 361 was signed into law. Um, it will allow for better communication between Dogami and counties. A um, lot of work between the um, aggregate association, Dogami, and the counties to get this done but uh, I feel pretty good about that law. We didn't quite get the real estate disclosure uh, bill across the finish line, but Senator Prozanski of House Judiciary had a sit down in a room with a, a working group, and we did um, come to some agreements about how to move that forward administratively. So the, the hope is, is that we will have some better ability for potential buyers of property to realize what might be around them in terms of goal five resources. Justice Court Collections by the Department of Revenue. This is a, an issue that used to be a priority for us, um, and we almost got it done in, um, in 2011. Um, it got reintroduced this year. I didn't pay much attention to this bill because our Justice Court um, presence is so small now. Uh, the bill didn't, really nobody got behind the bill, and it died in committee as a result. The uh, uh, road fund to sheriff patrol transfer sunset elimination, that's one that also has been on the board's radar for a number of years. Um, we did manage to get that, the sunset removed. So the significant part of that me is that when you have that sunset removed, then it becomes actually part of statute. So it will be, be a section of ORS, whereas before it was sort of exists as a note in ORS. Um, so we've got more permanence there with respect to county's ability to shift those federal forest dollars into sheriff patrol. Um, you guys mentioned uh, earlier today the e-cigarette regulatory framework. We did see the passage of House Bill 2546, which is a statewide framework uh, around e the sale of e-cigarettes. What did not get across the finish line was Senate Bill 663, which was the retail licensing structure. Um, we might see that come up again in the short session. It's not quite clear to me um, what will happen with that. I think there is a lot of interest by the Oregon Health Authority to have that. They need they need some uh, some funding for staff to actually do that. And so there are some iterations of an agency getting position authority and that sort of thing that become involved with this sort of work. But I think we'll see some interest on the, be on the part of the uh, Oregon Health Authority to continue to seek that retail licensing uh, uh, framework. Uh, item 12 is something that uh, uh, clerks have been working on for a long time. Um, trying to save some money at elections by not holding elections for precinct committee people, but in certain cases. So the uncontested races would just be essentially a given. Um, the almost made it across the finish line. There were two different versions of the House and the Senate, and it, ultimately the Senate did not agree uh, with the House language, and so the bill sort of died at that moment. So it was frustrating because there were two versions that came through both chambers. They just couldn't agree on the, on the final thing. Um, we didn't see too much work on uh, the lifting of preemption on local cigarette taxes. There was a bill. Um, it just it didn't it didn't make it across um, the finish line. It didn't didn't get much. I think we had a hearing on the bill. Talked to the chairman a little bit about it, but um, uh, it just was the timing just wasn't right. Sobering. Um, is a very interesting topic for us in Lane County, and uh, we had some good news with the passage of House Bill 2936. Sobering facilities are now defined in law. Um, that's a good thing. Uh, there's The statutes speak clearly now to what sort of liability a police agency has when they drop off an individual at a sobering center, and that was very important. Um, the unfortunate part is that where there's, there's still no permanent source of funding for sobering facilities. So we saw some earmarked money, um, and there's a yet-to-be-determined 
whether it will be a grant program or now how the money will be allocated, but about $3 million, we think, statewide for sobering facilities. We think we can probably get our hands on some of those dollars to support the work of the Buckley House here in Eugene. And then, finally, you heard this morning public health reform, House Bill 3100, was signed into law. I think, Commissioner Lichten, you asked a question about, and Commissioner Bozovich, you testified about this, this thing about, well, what happens if there's not funding? And that's the big question. I mean, nice policy bill that lays out a new way of doing business. Not a whole lot of conversation within the bill about how it's going to be funded. The good news is we were able to get some language in there that does say that if the funding is not adequate, then the counties turn that back to the state of Oregon. And I think we were really trying for something almost akin to Community Corrections Act funding that says, you know, if the legislature does not appropriate enough, then we have the ability to opt out. It's not quite that, but it's pretty good. And if you want to see it, I think it's Section 29 in the bill. But we feel pretty good about that language of having the counties sort of having a definite voice within this about adequacy of funding. We did establish, like I said, some priorities very late in the session. County bankruptcy, the Housing First project, and neither of those were able to advance. There was a fix it to the LRAPA board's structure. And the question about centrally assessed property, which had been subject of a fairly large lawsuit, was finalized. There's still some, the assessor tells me there's still some lack of clarity about sort of how that will play out for us in particular. So I did want to just touch on a couple of things that we also worked on during the session that were not part of our formal priorities, but I know the board had paid some attention to. There was a question of additional funding for DEQ staff from a surcharge on solid waste fees. That was passed by Senate Bill 245. There is now a $1.18 surcharge that we'll be turning over to the state for additional staff and work at the DEQ. The interesting piece on that bill is there is a, there's a process where, that they're going to determine by rule, where counties that are determined to be distressed get a rebate of those dollars. It's not clear how they're going to define an economically distressed county. And so that's a topic of the rulemaking that is currently ongoing. The, we had a, there was a, there was some issues again from DEQ about clean diesel and looking at how to regulate certain off-road vehicles, for example. That bill did die and did not advance. There was, it was, it was sort of dicey. It was alive all through the session, sort of living down at Ways and Means. And so we were watching it pretty closely, but it never did, never did revive. There was some public contracting laws that we were following pretty closely. And in particular, there was one that Lane County was sort of held up as why this law, this proposal was so great. We managed to suggest some alternatives to the stories that were being told in, in, in Salem that we think were based more on, on fact than what the proponents of the bill had been suggesting. That bill failed to advance. I think some of the commissioners here remember sort of a larger than life figure who died last year. Dave Barrows was one of the long, long time lobbyists in the Oregon legislature. Passed away suddenly last year. The lobby center is now going to be referred to as the Dave Barrows Lobby Center as a result of some action that the legislature took. And the nice thing about that is regardless of what happens to the, the Capitol building with respect to construction and seismic improvements, that name will continue to go wherever the lobby center goes. So that's, that's sort of neat. There was, finally, there was some work that we did with respect to doctor recruitment. Definitely on the radar screen of the legislature as it has been for us in our federal work. And 
uh, certain lobbyists for Trillium and I worked pretty hard on trying to make sure that there was um, the correct language in that bill to allow us as much flexibility in the future for doctor recruitment. And uh, we feel pretty good that, that we were successful in that effort as well. So with that, um, I'm going to open it up for any questions that you might have before I introduce uh, Sarah's work here. Commissioners. I can. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Alex, thank you very much. Just a couple things. I mean, uh, we can, I'm not going to harp on the lack of a transportation bill. I harped on that enough. And uh, it will probably be one of the more disappointing <laughs> uh, inactions I think this legislature has had. I'd like to actually focus in and, and maybe get your thoughts going back to uh, SB 885. And that is the. Uh, the Lane County Pilot Project to locally fund the career technical education and workforce development. And the reason why I want to bring that up is because, as you know, recently we were just included in the award of a manufacturing communities uh, legislation from uh, that came from the federal government. Uh, I guess the question I have is: there a way to maybe connect the dots on this one? Because I really feel that this is this is one now where you can talk about because if you look at what the 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 idea is to to incorporation is I mean economic development and lane workforce development I mean there it is right there is there a way that maybe because we've been awarded that that maybe this can be reintroduced and maybe connect more of those dots to really so maybe there there's opportunity to get support for that because I I just uh, I don't know about you, but I'm getting sick and tired of hearing that Clark County is the fastest growing county in the Pacific Northwest. And it is. I mean, that is fact. And until we maybe see some sort of tax reform, something that happens in this state, we're going to continue to lose out to Clark County, to Provo, Utah, to Boise, and yet these other communities around that just basically surround us because we're taking our competitiveness out. And to me, this is a great way to connect the dots. Being uh, having this new this manufactured communities uh, designation, Lane County is now a part of that. And uh, so I, maybe your thoughts on this, and you know, if if you think there's any uh, appetite, I guess, for lack of a better word, to, to reintroduce this. I don't know if the short session, or we're going to have to wait till uh, 2017 session comes into play. Maybe just to gather your thoughts on this, and if that is an opportunity to connect those dots. Uh, Chair Bozovich and Commissioner Lincoln, that's um, an interesting, uh, interesting question. You know, I don't think we would introduce a, reintroduce a bill as written. Um, as you know, what we were trying to do was sort of like the road fund transfers. We were suggesting to take the federal forest dollars that would normally go into um, mm -hmm. the school fund and earmark them instead to the partnership to also do career and tech ed. Um, that said, what I saw with CTE money is there was a lot of, there was some focus on especially um, um, tech, you know, to say, okay, if we're going to do career and technical education, let's make sure that those proposals are focusing on tech ed. Um, you know, the, the um, Investing in Manufacturing Communities Partnership in the Northwest was particularly interested in advanced wood products. And so, you know, that might be an angle where we could work on some of that kind of language where we would then position ourselves for some of those dollars to come to us. I, you know, that's, that is, that's not a bad idea. What I was, again, what I was also interested in was this idea that, as far as I can tell, these dollars go to schools and there's not a great mm -hmm. feedback loop back to the legislature to say, okay, what was the experience? What was the effect of those dollars? How effective were they at getting kids into that pipeline? And um, I think in Eugene Springfield, there's probably some unique resources for providing better data back to the legislature about those investments. And so that's another thought I had was how could we leverage some of those dollars to go into some of our entities here that are uh, researchers that are good at collecting data like um, Christina Payne at the Workforce Partnership with respect to these kinds of things. So I think there's some opportunities there and um, 
like I said, we were we were able to insert ourselves into the conversation. So, to the extent we can sort of maintain that toehold, I think that's probably smart. This isn't your grandfather's manufacturing anymore, and that's that's how I want to make sure that we we just saw it in the national paper. Medium in medium wage, ninety-five thousand dollars a year. That's advanced manufacturing. And to me, when you look at wood products, they uh, to, you know uh, whether people have a a positive or negative reaction over the wood products industry. It is high-tech manufacturing, and that's really how we need to present this. And uh, if we're going to stay competitive, this is going to be key. So, I, you know, however it can be reintroduced, I, I don't know, but I, I really think this is something we should keep her eye out um, as as a potential, and um, especially after being awarded that uh, that that designation. So, appreciate it. That's the question I had, and I uh, thank you for the uh, for the presentation. Any other questions? I just want to note real quick, you know, on that DEQ FTE bill, and where they got the, they got the extra dollar, the tipping fee went up to a buck eighteen. Those FTE were to run a you know recycling program for counties because some counties are failing to meet the state's goals relative to recycling. Lane County is meeting our goals, so you know the real issue that's coming up on recycling is the actual tipping fee for co-mingled uh, recycling um, right now has jumped up for private haulers to $35 a ton. And that's going to be the real challenge. And, and raising our tipping fees at, our, our, at Short Mountain for regular garbage to support education programs that are not really needed in this county is not helping us in that, that effort. So it's just it was, it was a bill we took a, 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 an against stance on and were unsuccessful because we didn't feel that they were necessary FTE, nor, they, nor did it benefit Lane County. So I guess we're moving on to marijuana now. <laughs> <laughs> so you have in your packet attachment B, which uh, Sarah Chinsky is the author of. She's also got some slides she's going to show you. Um, I just wanted to, for, to just give you a brief introduction here. Obviously, the voters passed Measure 91, and uh, the legislature, because it was a legislative um, initiative, the legislature had the ability to futz with it, if you will. And while it was a fairly decently written initiative, there were some problems with it that the legislature wanted to address. They created the... Um, uh, perhaps aptly or inaptly named um, Joint Committee on Implementation of, Mar of uh, Measure 91. Um, that, that committee worked very hard um, early in the session and spent a lot of time trying to rectify uh, medical marijuana with recreational marijuana. And that was advice they'd gotten after a, um, feedback from how Colorado implemented their law. So there was some criticism about the amount of time they were spending on medical marijuana, but I think from their perspective, they really saw that work as foundational to be able to implement Measure 91. Um, it, but it was sort of interesting because that committee just couldn't, they couldn't manage to get all their work done. And uh, towards the end of the session, it was actually split into two separate committees. So there was a House committee and a Senate committee that helped sort of move things along. Um, the, uh, Sarah and I were on a regular um, communication weekly. They, they had hearings, not every week, but um, we, were, we were in close communication to sort of say, hey, do we need to be inserting ourselves with any sort of comments from Lane County at this point? It was, a, it was a continued topic of conversation at the Legislative Committee, and uh, so we monitored it pretty closely. You know, um, this has been a very contentious issue and a very complex issue, and I think, you know, for me, I've had to sort of temper my expectations. Um, we saw a key person at OLCC who was responsible for some of the rulemaking get fired. Uh, relatively late in the session because of some of his actions. We've seen uh, a, the, just yesterday, I think it was the state of uh, uh, Washington announced that their guy who'd been involved with all the rulemaking development for their program resigned because of just the pressure of trying to rectify these two, the, their medical marijuana and their uh, recreational marijuana systems. Um, today I saw in the newspaper that industrial hemp Permits have been essentially, uh, there's been a um, moratorium on issuing new industrial hemp because of, I'm not sure what, but some sort of complex 
complexity with respect to impact of industrial hemp on um, medical marijuana grow sites in southern Oregon. So this is a highly, highly complicated arena of public policy, not to mention the overlay of the federal law, right? So, you, you know, you just got a lot of different things happening. And I think what Sarah's going to try to do today is give you a sense of, you know, sort of the high level aspects of this bill, where the board has authority and where they don't. And what we're trying to set up is that there will be a conversation, I think, scheduled for September 18th. I think it's 15th. 15th. 15th where you'll really have some questions about land use. Mm -hmm. And those, that's one place where um, all along Sarah had said, you know where this is going to get really interesting is in land use. And so you'll see that presentation come on the 15th. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Sarah and uh, uh, be interested to, to see how this evolves. Um, good morning, and in consideration of time, I'll just go ahead and hit the high points that I have in the PowerPoint. The attachment has more detail, but I'll just go ahead and... Um, so the legislation that was introduced uh, in 2015 session, uh, the big one is uh, House Bill 3400. That's the omnibus bill that amends the Oregon Medical Marijuana Act and Measure 91. Um, it's about a 130-page bill. It's huge, and there's a lot of detail in there um, related to both medical and changes to Measure 91. House Bill 2041 uh, revises the state tax structure for recreational marijuana. In the original Measure 91, it started out as a grower's tax. Um, it's now been changed to a point of sale tax, which is easier to implement and collect. Senate Bill 460 is the bill that authorizes the early sale of recreational marijuana by medical marijuana dispensaries. Uh, Senate Bill 80, 844 creates a marijuana task force and provides for expungement of certain offenses. Uh, it also allows certain hospice and residential facilities to be designated as an additional caregiver under the Medical Marijuana Act. Uh, Senate Joint Memorial 12 encourages Congress to declassify marijuana from Schedule 1 in the Controlled Substances Act, and it also identifies issues for the state of Oregon in implementing Measure 91, which are banking and research by public institutions. Um, there, obviously, there's federal issues with federal law um, with both of those. So under federal law, marijuana is still... Um, under the Controlled Substances Act, a Schedule One drug, which means that it has a high potential for abuse. Um, according to federal law, it has no currently accepted medical use in the treatment in the United States, and there's a lack of accepted safety for use of the drug or other substance under medical supervision. Measure 91 has decriminalized personal growing and use by persons 21 years of age and older. It's designated OLCC with the licensing and regulate uh, of the growing, processing, and sale of recreational marijuana. There are four types of licensing under Measure 91. There's producers, processors, wholesalers, and retailers, and an individual may hold uh, more than one type of license. Under the personal allowance section, a person 21 or older can have in their household up to eight ounces of homegrown usable marijuana, up to four marijuana plants, up to 16 ounces of homemade cannabinoid products in solid form, um, up to 72 ounces of homemade cannabinoid products in liquid form, and up to 16 ounces of homemade cannab cannabinoid concentrates. And this is per household, not per individual, which is an important distinction. Um, a person 21 or older can deliver to another person 21 or older for non-commercial purposes up to one ounce of homegrown marijuana, um, up to 16 ounces of homemade cannabinoid products in solid form, up to 72 ounces of homemade cannabinoid products in liquid form, and up to 16 ounces of homemade cannabinoid concentrates. Um, so House Bill 2041 imposes the tax on the retail sale of marijuana. Um, it's to be imposed upon consumers and collected by the retailers. It's a 17% point of sale tax. Beginning October 1st, uh, medical marijuana dispensaries are going to be allowed to sell limited marijuana retail product. There is an early sales tax rate that will begin January 2016, it will be 25% on those limited products. Um, however, there will be no tax applied between October and January. That early sales tax begins January 2016. The 
the idea is uh, OLCC does not foresee being able to have licensed retail outlets up and running prior to the third quarter of 2016, so they want to have a legal outlet where people can purchase the product. Um, beginning on December 31st, 2016, those early start provisions of House Bill 2041 are going to be repealed. The tax distribution um, from the state will be 40% to the Common School Fund, 20% to the Mental Health, Alcoholism, and Drug Services, 15% to state police, 10% to cities, 10% to counties, and 5% to the Oregon Health Authority for alcohol and drug abuse prevention, early intervention, and treatment. The distribution to the cities and counties um, prior to July 2017 is going to be based on population. After July 1st, 2017, it's um, a much more complicated allocation. 50% of the 10% based is going to be based on the number of licenses, the production processor and wholesale licenses issued in the jurisdiction of either the city or the county. It makes it very specific, identifies incorporated areas versus unincorporated areas. And 50% of the 10% is going to be based on the number of licenses, retail licenses issued in each city and county. Um, the early sales of recreational marijuana are going to begin October 1st, 2015 at medical marijuana dispensaries. Uh, there will be limited products, so a quarter ounce of leaves and flowers per person per day, um, or four marijuana plants that are not flowering, and also marijuana seeds. There's, there are no regulations. You know, a person could technically go to multiple dispensaries and obviously buy more product, but that's what they're limited to in each individual dispensary. There is the ability for a local jurisdiction to adopt an ordinance prohibiting early sales without referring it to the voters. Uh, under House Bill 3400, um, does not restrict where medical marijuana grow sites or recreational marijuana producers can locate. Those are going to be uh, local land use jurisdiction issues. It does place more stringent limitations on the number of plants that a medical marijuana grower can have in residential zone, and it does direct the OLCC to adopt rules restricting the size of recreational grow canopies. Um, under medical grow site regulations, in a residential zone, a medical grow site may have up to 12 mature plants. In any other zone, they're able to have up to 48 mature plants. There are exceptions to this rule. If the grower um, has registered with the site prior to January 1, 2015, that grow site is limited to the number of plants that were at the grow site um, as of December 31, 2015, not to exceed 24 mature plants in a residential zone and uh, 96 mature plants in other zones. Um, medical marijuana dispensaries may not be located in residential zones. They may not locate within 1,000 feet of most schools. Uh, a dispensary may not be located at the same address as a grow site, and a dispensary may not be located within 1,000 feet of another dispensary. On January 20, 2016, Oregon Health Authority are going to stop issuing cards to patients without Oregon addresses. This has been something with the Oregon Medical Marijuana Act. Um, that has been available to people that are not residents of Oregon. Medical marijuana growers are going to fall under the new residency requirements. And beginning July 1st, any new medical marijuana growers that have had to demonstrate that they've lived in Oregon for two years in order to be um, registered with the state. Wholesale and retail licensees may not locate in an area zone exclusively for residential use and may not locate within 1,000 feet of schools. The local tax option gives the governing body of a city or county um, the authority to adopt an ordinance to be referred to the electors. Uh, it may not exceed 3% on the sale of marijuana items sold, and it must refer the ordinance to the electors at the next statewide general election. Uh, if a local jurisdiction, however, prohibits the establishment of any of the recreational marijuana licenses or any of the medical marijuana registrants, it does not have the authority to impose a local tax. Uh, local jurisdictions may prohibit uh, certain activities within their jurisdiction, recreational marijuana producers, processors, wholesalers, and retailers, and, med and medical marijuana processors and dispensaries. 
So in enacting the ban, um, before December 24, 2015, a local jurisdiction that voted against Measure 91 by 55 percent or more can enact the ban without referring it to the voters on any of those listed activities. After December 24th, it must be referred to the voters as a statewide general election. Um, and adoption of the ordinance essentially acts as a moratorium on new facilities until the election occurs. Some medical activity is not subject to the ban. Those dispensaries and processors that have been registered with the state before the local jurisdiction adopts its prohibition, um, those dispensaries are not subject to the ban if they've already successfully completed a land use application process. And a local jurisdiction enacting a prohibition on any of the marijuana activities will likely not be eligible to receive any stat state tax revenues or again impose the local tax. Um, a land use compatibility statement is going to be required um, for all licensing um, processing for all licensing for recreational licenses, excuse me. And you'll get more of a land use update um, from, I believe it's going to be Mark Rust from uh, land use uh, from Public Works. You do have the ability to uh, adopt reasonable time, place, manner regulations. This includes hours of operation, location, manner of operation, um, also taking into consider the public's access to the premises. And this last slide is um, the most recent list of jurisdictions that have decided to ban marijuana activities in their jurisdictions. And I believe that all of these have decided to place a ban on all four types of licensing. And I have that in front of me here. They have the bans that are being um, by these jurisdictions prohibit producers, processors, wholesalers, and retail licensing. So you can see where jurisdictions <coughs> will need to put it before the voters in the next general election and certain jurisdictions do not because they received a vote of 55 percent or more in opposition to Measure 91. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Any questions? Well, that was a lot taken. <laughs> Sorry. Not to mention uh, uh, the, the background material, which is even lengthier. And if you really wanted to read the measures, it's even lengthier. So I appreciate the summary. Um, just to make clear, the, the optional 3% local tax, when they refer to the next general election, they're referring to an even year November election? Correct. OK. So it's not like we'd have to do it for this November. Correct. Mr. Farr. Just a comment. I'd like to uh, thank you all for providing the high-level view of the Joint Committee's work. <laughs> <laughs> I'm choking enough with the smoke. Ah, um, uh, yes, yeah, smoke in the air, high-level things. How do you follow up with that one? Uh, <laughs> Any other questions for staff on, on, the, on the legislative update? I r really appreciate that. I guess we need to start thinking about, um, I guess, is legislative committee scheduled to meet in the near future to start talking about the short session and um, if there are any additional priorities we need to identify? Uh, Chair uh, Bozovich and commissioners, I haven't I uh, sought a legislative committee meeting. I wanted to um, have this presentation first. Um, legislative days will be, legislative days are three days of hearings that will occur, that occur during the interim. Um, this year we're going to have legislative days in um, September, November, and either December or January. I think I put it on here. So we'll start to get a sense of where the, um, where the committees, yeah, it's September, November, and January. So there will be nine days of interim hearings totally before the short session starts. We'll start to see uh, from that work a sense of perhaps some, you know, signals to what the legislature is contemplating. Um, I've already heard, you know, just through the grapevine sort of rumblings about this and that and what the, legis what the short session will address and particularly what they won't address. So um, 
My sense was, again, that there's a couple things that came out of the session, the courthouse funding, um, the used firearms transactions. There's a couple things that I'm sort of aware that will, that I think we will, will continue to be priorities and there's an opportunity in the short session. Um, some uh, staff uh, and um, commissioners have already alerted me to various conceptual ideas of things that that, um, that they see as potentially a need for legislative priorities. Whether or not we can get those going during the short, short session is, is another question. The short session is 35 days. T typically, it's pretty scripted. So you, we just have to remain as flexible as possible to see where there are opportunities. I'm happy to, uh, I guess to answer your question, yes, we will have one. I don't have one scheduled yet. Okay. I just. Um, <clears throat> Remembering the last short session, we laid the groundwork for some of our successes in this sh session. So if we have those priorities identified, we might be able to start our work with the legislators to get them educated and then, you know, you walk into the next long session already that far down the road, like getting an actual legislative concept drafted, et cetera. Yeah. So I appreciate that. Any other questions for staff? Great. Well, thank you very much. So that moves on to uh, County Council. I don't think they had any announcements other than we do have need for an exec session. Hopefully it will be brief. Uh, commissioner's business announcements. Any announcements from commissioners? Then how about agenda team request or work session requests? Moving right along, review of assignments. I didn't have any, hopefully, the responses to the public comment this morning because I did hear a, a couple questions about the um, policy on naming. I hope I provide enough clarity there, but if there's any follow-up that's desired, we can certainly respond to it. Other than that, I didn't hear any assignments. So if there's, I'll first go to other, other business before we go to exec session. Is there any other business for the board this morning? So um, I'm going to take us into exec session, and I'm not planning on um, us coming out in the regular session. I don't believe there's anything on exec session that requires us to take action, public action. So I'm going to probably adjourn us out of exec session. So um, the Board of Commissioners will meet in executive session to conduct deliberations with persons designated by the governing body to carry on labor negotiations. This executive session is held pursuant to ORS 192660-2D, which allows the Board of Commissioners to meet in executive session for the purposes listed above. Representatives of the news media and designated staff shall be allowed to attend the executive session. All other members of the audience are asked to leave the room. Representatives of the news media are specifically directed not to report on any deliberations during the executive session except to state the general subject of the session as previously announced. No decisions may be made in the executive session, um, and I don't believe we're going to come back out in the public session, so we will probably adjourn from there. We are now um, recessed into executive session. We'll meet in the Board of Commissioners Conference Room as quickly as we can reconvene.